Is the Buddha real? Read to find out. There was a person who went to his regular barber shop to get a haircut, a shave, and his ears cleaned. As the barber's skilled hands worked swiftly, he kept up a lively conversation with his client. From discussing local gossip, they suddenly delved into spiritual and theological topics, eventually turning to the question, does the Buddha really exist? While trimming a messy tuft of hair on the client's forehead, the barber firmly stated, there's no such thing as the Buddha in this world. Being a spiritually inclined person, the client was upset and asked, Why do you say that? The barber explained nonstop, Just look around on the streets. So many children have to roam around to make a living. Many elderly people still have to bend over in rain and sun selling things on the streets. Countless homeless people sleep on sidewalks every night. Not to mention, hospitals are overcrowded and full of suffering. If there really was a compassionate Buddha always looking out for us, then why haven't these suffering lives been saved? The client remained silent. After paying and stepping out of the barber shop, he noticed a man across the street with unkempt, shaggy hair and beard, obviously long overdue for a haircut and shave. The client went back into the shop and loudly said, You see, there are no barbers in this world. The barber was taken aback. How can you say that? Who am I then? Didn't I just give you a haircut here? The client pulled the barber to the door, pointing across the street. There. Barbers don't exist because if they did, that man wouldn't have such shaggy hair and beard. Wrong. Barbers do exist, but if that guy doesn't choose to come in, even if there are many barbers, there's nothing they can do. The client smiled. Exactly. It's the same with the Buddha. He's always reaching out to us, but we refuse to seek him and take his hand. We always find ways to deny the Buddha and pride ourselves on our limited abilities. That's the deep-rooted cause of all suffering in this world. Reflection Normally, people only believe in the Buddha if their prayers are answered and claim there's no Buddha if their desires are unmet. Indeed, the Buddha's existence in the world isn't for humans to test his existence with their desires. To know if the Buddha truly saves, you should follow his teachings. The so-called outstretched hand is actually his doctrine. This doctrine is like a map. If you follow it, you will escape suffering and personally experience happiness, freeing yourself from being a slave to desires and the objects you beg from. 2. Giving and Receiving One day, a young student had the chance to take a walk with his professor. This professor was affectionately known as the student's friend by many, thanks to his friendly and kind nature towards students. While walking, they came across a pair of old shoes in the middle of the road. They figured the shoes belonged to a poor farmer who might be finishing his day's work in a nearby field. The student suggested to the professor, Let's play a prank on the farmer. I'll hide his shoes, and we can hide behind those bushes to see how he reacts when he can't find them. The professor stopped him and said, Hey, young man, we should never make fun of the poor for our amusement. But since you're well off, you can find much greater joy through this farmer. Put a coin in each shoe and watch his reaction. Following the professor's advice, the student placed a coin in each shoe and then they hid behind nearby bushes. Soon the farmer finished his work and walked over to where his shoes and coat were placed. As he put on his coat and slipped his foot into one of the shoes, he felt something hard inside. He bent down to check and found a coin. Shocked, he looked at the coin closely, turning it over and examining it. He looked around but saw no one. He then put the coin in his pocket and proceeded to put on the other shoe, where he found another coin. Overwhelmed with emotion, the farmer knelt down, looked up to the sky, and loudly thanked whoever had given him this timely gift that would help his family out of hardship, his sick wife, and his hungry children. The student was moved to tears by the sight. The professor then asked, Do you feel happier now than you would have felt playing a prank on him? 
The young man replied, Professor, you've taught me a lesson I'll never forget. Now I truly understand the meaning of the phrase I once didn't comprehend. It is better to give than to receive. 3. The Value of Life In a temple, one day a young novice asked his master, Master, what is the value of a person's life? I ask because I often see people come to the temple praying for a meaningful life. So, you want to know what the value of human life is, right? Yes, master. The master went into his room and came out with an ugly stone, instructing, Take this stone to the market and try to sell it. But remember, even if someone wants to buy it, do not sell it and bring it back to me. Why do I have to do that, master? If you want to understand the value of life, do as I say. Driven by curiosity about the value of life, the young novice followed the master's instructions. He sat in the market all day trying to sell the stone, wondering why this ugly stone could represent the value of life. The novice sat all day without a single inquiry from anyone. People found it odd and couldn't understand why he was trying to sell a worthless stone. At the end of the day, a sympathetic peddler approached and offered 500 dong for the stone. Remembering the master's instruction not to sell regardless of any offer, the novice did not sell it and returned to the master. Master, what is special about this stone that you asked me to sell? Fortunately, someone offered 500 dong for it, so what is the value of life? The master smiled and said, Well done. Tomorrow take the stone to a gold shop and try to sell it to the owner. Remember, even if the owner wants to buy it, do not sell it. Then you will understand what life's value is. Curious, the novice did as the master said. The next day he took the stone to a gold shop, thinking about why the master had him sell the stone there, especially since no one wanted it the previous day and it seemed worthless. Despite feeling embarrassed, out of curiosity, he decided to follow the master's instruction. The novice was surprised when the gold shop owner offered five million dong for the stone. Shocked by the increase in value from 500 dong to 5 million in just a day, he remembered the master's words and did not sell the stone, bringing it back to the master. Master, why did the stone's value increase so dramatically in just one day? The master laughed and said, If you want to understand what the value of life is, take the stone to an antique shop tomorrow and try to sell it. Remember, no matter the offer, do not sell it and bring it back to me. You will understand what the value of life is. Even more curious, the novice followed the master's instruction. The next day, he took the stone to an antique shop where, to his surprise, the owner offered to trade his entire fortune for the stone. The novice did not sell and hurried back to the master. So what is this stone that no one wanted to buy before, but now it's worth a fortune? The master said, that is the value of life. The value of each person's life is determined by ourselves, just as you decided whether to sell the stone or not and chose to take something perceived as worthless to a place where it was highly valued. The value of life is determined by where we place ourselves, where people understand us, and where our values are respected. 4. Four Fingers When he was born, the boy was blind. At age six, something happened that he couldn't explain. One afternoon, while playing with friends, another boy threw a ball towards him. Suddenly remembering, the boy shouted, Watch out! The ball is going to hit you! The ball struck him and his life was no longer the same. He wasn't hurt, but he was truly puzzled. He decided to ask his mom, How did he know what was about to happen to me before I even realized it? His mom sighed, realizing the moment she had dreaded had arrived. It was the first time she needed to clearly tell her son, You are blind. Very gently, she took his hand, 
held each finger and counted. One, two, three, four, five. These fingers are like your five senses. This little finger is hearing. This pretty finger is touch. This tiny one is smell. And this little one is taste. After hesitating for a moment, she continued, And this tiny finger here is sight. Each of your senses is like a finger, sending messages to your brain. Then she folded the finger she named sight, pressing it into his palm and said, My dear, you are different from other children because you only have four senses, just like having only four fingers. One, hear, two, touch, three, smell, four, taste. You can't use the sense of sight. Now mom wants to show you this. Stand up, please. He stood up. His mother picked up the ball and said, Now place your hand in a position to catch the ball. He opened his palm, and in that moment he felt the hard ball touch his fingers. He gripped the ball tightly and lifted it high. Well done, well done, his mother said. I want you never to forget what you just did. You can also lift the ball high with four fingers instead of five. You can also have and maintain a full and happy life with just four senses if you approach life with consistent effort. The boy would never forget the image of four fingers instead of five. For him, it was a symbol of hope. And whenever he felt discouraged by his limitations, he remembered this symbol to motivate himself. He realized that his mom was right. He could still create and sustain a full life with just the four senses he possessed. 5. Violet's Wish in a garden, there was a lovely violet flower always radiating a sweet fragrance. She lived happily alongside her neighboring friends. One day, looking at the elegant rose with its vibrant beauty brightening the whole garden, Violet felt very small. She sighed. Compared to that lucky rose, I'm nothing. I wish I could be a rose just once in my life, just once to not lie close to the ground. I would be so content. A fairy, happening to overhear, asked the little flower, What's wrong, dear? Violet replied earnestly, I know you are kind and full of love. Please turn me into a rose. The fairy looked closely at the flower and said, Do you realize what you're asking for? You might regret it one day. But Violet kept pleading. Moved by her desire, the fairy finally agreed. She touched Violet with her magical finger, and instantly Violet turned into a beautiful, proud rose, towering with bright red blooms on its branches. One day, a storm swept through the garden, breaking branches and uprooting tall trees. The garden was devastated, except for the small, ground-hugging flowers like Violet used to be. After the storm cleared, the sky was blue again. The violets waved their purple petals, playing together. One looked at the rose, once violet, and said sympathetically, Look, she's paying the price for her fleeting wish. The rose, crushed on the ground, broken and tattered, struggled to breathe and whispered, I never knew to fear the storm. When I was a small violet, I often felt comfortable and satisfied with myself. But staying the same made me feel small, boring, and bland. I didn't want to live a life only clinging to the ground in fear and weakness, to be buried under snow in winter. Today, though I am about to leave you all, I am thrilled and satisfied because I experienced the colorful world above. I lived as a true rose, looking up to see the sun, hearing the whispers of the wind, and playing with the morning dew. I could touch the robe of the light god with my fragrant petals, I will die, but I have reached the end of my desire to live. I fulfilled my dream. That is the most meaningful thing in my life. With that, she slowly closed her withered petals and breathed her last with a content smile on her lips. 6. The Teacher and the Old Bills He finally got into college. The first person he wanted to share this important news with wasn't his dad or mom, but his beloved teacher. His family was poor, 
with many siblings, and he came from a poor village. So for a long time, not many people even thought about sending their kids to college. His parents felt the same, partly because they were too poor and partly because they thought about their child's chances. How can he compete with others? His teacher was the only one who supported him, giving him the belief that you can do it. His joy was short-lived as worries soon overwhelmed him. For five years, hundreds of expenses buzzed in his head like a swarm of bees. Then the teacher came with a bunch of books and notebooks, which he guessed were lessons on humanity, courtesy, righteousness, and handed him a small packet saying it was a secret weapon to be opened only in the toughest times. He didn't suspect a thing. The secret weapon he received from the teacher turned out to be a stack of 10,000 dong bills, old and crumpled, wrapped in worn plastic, which he believed the teacher had saved up for a long time. 900,000 dong. He kept touching the old bills, longing for a corner where no one could see him cry. It's been two years since that day the teacher trekked to Saigon to visit him, handing him those hard-earned 10,000 dong bills, then hurried back home. After that, the teacher was transferred. Occasionally, over two years, he still received the 10,000 dong from his teacher, strangely at times when he felt most stuck. In two years, he hadn't visited his teacher once. At noon, just back from school, his mother called to say, Teacher H has passed away. All he could stammer was three words. Why did he die? Then collapsed as his mother choked up on the other end. The teacher had been sick for a long time, but no one knew. The day they took him to the hospital, the doctors found out all his organs had failed, and before anyone could visit, he was gone. He dropped everything and jumped on the bus. In the sweltering midday heat, dizzy from travel sickness, he saw his gentle teacher come beside him, pushing into his sweaty hands the shiny 10,000 dong bills. Only then did he notice how pale the teacher had become, his once nimble hands now bony and veined. Suddenly alert, tears streamed down his cheeks. His heart cried out in anguish. Teacher, why didn't you wait for me to come back? He always thought. If only he could turn those 10,000 dong bills into medicine, the teacher would have lived until he could return. 7. There comes a day. There will come a time when you suddenly realize the subtle difference between holding a hand and chaining a soul. There will come a time when you understand that love is not always a support and being together does not guarantee peace. There will come a time when you learn that a kiss is not a commitment and a gift is not the same as a heartfelt promise. There will come a time when you realize that not every sunny season is beautiful, and you will learn to accept failure with your head held high and bright eyes with the grace of maturity rather than the despair and stubbornness of youth. Everyone stumbles a few times. Pick up the pieces and move forward from here on the path you've chosen today, without relying on the uncertainties of tomorrow. Give freely without regret or clinging. Has anyone ever truly lost by giving? Keep only the best things. Sow seeds and grow flowers in the soil of your soul rather than wear yourself out waiting for someone else to bring them. And you will realize that you have overcome. Life becomes more meaningful. Dream freely of what is to come. Look beyond the window frame. Gaze at the stars. Feel truly alive, capable, strong, and deserving. No matter what happens, it's all a beginning, with everything you inherently possess waiting for you ahead. In the twinkling eyes of faith that a new day brings, you never lose by loving. You only lose by holding on too tightly. Hey, everyone. Your comments truly matter, offering insights and motivation to others and uplifting our creative team at Lighthouse of Wisdom Channel. Sharing your thoughts and experiences enriches our community. So let's get the conversation started below and help illuminate our path with your wisdom. Eight, 
Tell me who you love, and I'll tell you who you are. John Blanchard quickly stood up from the bench, straightened his uniform, and watched as crowds hurried into Grand Central Station. He was searching for a woman he felt he knew well, yet had never met. She would be holding a rose. He first encountered her 13 months ago in a Florida library. As he pulled a book from the shelf, his curiosity wasn't piqued by the book's content, but by the thoughtful, handwritten notes in the margins. They reflected a person of depth and sensitivity. He found the name of the previous borrower on the front cover, Miss Hollis Maynell from New York City. John wrote to her, introducing himself and expressing his wish to get acquainted. The next day, he was to board a train to join the Army during World War II. Over 13 months, they grew to know each other through letters, each letter a seed of love blossoming in their hearts, their romance matured. Blanchard had asked for a photo, but she refused, saying if he truly loved her, her appearance wouldn't matter. Finally, the day came for him to return from Europe, and they arranged to meet for the first time at 7 p.m. at Grand Central Station. You'll recognize me by the red rose I'll wear on my coat, she wrote. At precisely 7 p.m., Blanchard arrived and looked for the woman he loved but had never seen. A young woman approached me, slender with curly golden hair framing her small ears, her eyes as blue as flower petals, her lips and chin distinctly beautiful, glowing in a light blue coat like spring arriving. I started towards her, completely overlooking that she wasn't wearing a rose. As I approached, she smiled provocatively and whispered, Will you come with me? Irresistibly, he moved closer, then spotted Hollis Maynell standing right behind her, a woman over 40 with neatly arranged graying hair under a worn hat. She had a stocky build and wore low-heeled shoes. The woman in blue quickly walked away. Torn, part of him wanted to follow the young woman, but deep down, he felt a bond with the soul that had accompanied him through their letters. Maynell was still there. Her face, pale and round, was gentle and affectionate with warm gray-brown eyes. No longer hesitating, he held out the blue leather-bound book that helped her recognize him. Perhaps this was not just love, but something even more precious, a friendship he had to cherish and be grateful for. Standing firm, he greeted her and extended the book, though he felt a pang of disappointment as he said, I am Lieutenant John Blanchard, and you must be Miss Maynell. I'm pleased you could meet me. May I take you to dinner? Her face relaxed into a generous smile. I don't know what to say, young man, she replied, but a young woman in blue passed by here, asked me to pin this rose on my coat, and told me to tell you if you asked me out for dinner, she is waiting for you at the big restaurant at the corner. She said this was just a small test. It wasn't hard to realize what was happening, and I admired Maynell's wisdom. If it's true love from the heart, it responds even if the person doesn't have a striking appearance. As Husay wrote, Tell me who you love, and I'll tell you who you are. 9. Try a different approach. You're setting a trap for yourself if you keep locking into just one way of thinking without trying to find another way. It was an ordinary day at the end of July. I was sitting in a quiet room in a small hotel hidden among pine trees, listening to the desperate sounds of a life-or-death struggle happening just a few steps from where I was seated. It was a tiny fly exerting its last bit of strength to get past the window glass. Its trembling wings seemed to tell a tragic story of its strategy, try harder. But this strategy wasn't working. The fly's frantic efforts brought no hope. Ironically, this battle was creating a trap for itself. The harder it tried, the faster it exhausted itself. It was futile for the fly to try to break through the glass with its little strength. Yet, it had staked its life on achieving its goal with effort and determination. In the end, the fly succumbed to a tragic fate. It collapsed and died on the windowsill. Only ten steps away, a door stood wide open. It would only take ten seconds to fly there, 
and this tiny creature could have been outside in the world it sought. Just a fraction of the effort wasted could have freed it from the trap it had set for itself. If the fly hadn't locked itself into one way of thinking and tried another way, it could have found an easy escape. Trying harder is not always the necessary solution to achieve success. It might not promise what you're hoping to achieve in life. Often, it can be the beginning of more complex, worse problems. If you bet all your hopes on finding a single way out by putting all your effort into a narrow goal, you might destroy other chances you have. 10. No matter what happens, and if you show forgiveness, some might think you are too lenient. Nevertheless, forgive them anyway. If you are kind to everyone, some might suspect you have an ulterior motive. Despite that, continue to be genuine with others and yourself. If you live honestly, some may try to deceive you. Even so, keep being true to yourself and to others. If you succeed, opportunists will come your way. Nonetheless, always strive for success. If you find happiness, some will be envious and try to ruin it. Regardless, keep seeking and cherishing your happiness. The good deeds you do today might be forgotten tomorrow. However, keep doing good anyway. It might take you years to build something and someone could destroy it in a moment. Even so, keep doing what you believe in. There will be times you feel disappointed because you trusted the wrong people, but never let yourself become cynical or discouraged. It's better to have trusted and been deceived than never to have trusted at all. You give your best to life, but often people still aren't satisfied. Despite that, keep giving your best. No matter what, let go of the things that insult or hurt you or the injustices others may do to you and continue to live in the way you believe is right and best. That way, no matter what happens, you will always be able to hold your head high without shame or regret when facing your own conscience. 11. The Invisible House I often talk about a house you can't see, which I call conscience. Even though I may move many times, this house always follows me. Deep within each of us, there is such a house. I will never forget what I've experienced in this house. Today, I did something meaningful. I felt a quiet joy, and I felt secure and happy. I returned and lived in this house with an unparalleled pure happiness. Today, I made a mistake. I tried to hide my worries behind a smiling face. But strangely, when I looked into this inner house, I saw very clearly the consequences of my actions. This house still holds many mysteries for me. I don't know what it's made of, but it's very durable and doesn't change over time. Whether I like it or not, I will continue to live in my invisible house. When I err or do something wrong, I may want to avoid this house, but I know I can't. This house reflects, even amplifies, my thoughts, helping me to adjust my attitude. Thank you to my house of conscience. Because of this house, I always know how to self-reflect and find myself again, think positively, live actively, and do things that bring happiness to myself and others. 12. Five Minutes and Caring one afternoon in the park, a woman sat down next to a man on a bench. That's my son, the woman started, pointing towards a boy in a red outfit playing on the slide. He looks sharp. My son is over there on the swings, the one in the blue outfit, the man replied, glancing at his watch before calling out, Todd, it's time to go. Todd pleaded, Dad, can I have five more minutes? The father nodded in agreement and Todd continued to play on the swing. After five minutes, the man stood up, calling him again. Is it time to go already? The boy said reluctantly and once again pleaded, Just five more minutes, please. This is the last time, Dad. The father smiled and said, Okay, just five more minutes. The woman sitting next to him commented, You really are a patient and loving father, but you shouldn't spoil him too much. After a pause, the man softly explained, I used to be so caught up with work that I didn't have time for my family. 
Every time I came home, my older son Tommy would beg, Dad, play with me, just for five minutes. But I often put him off with, in a bit, son. Last year, while Tommy was biking alone in the park, he was hit by a car driven by a drunk driver. At that moment, I deeply regretted not spending time with him and realized I'd lost any chance to be with him, even for just a short five minutes. I vowed never to let that happen again with Todd. So, whenever I give him those extra five minutes on the swing he loves, it's also a moment for me to cherish more time watching my beloved son. It means a lot to both of us. 13. What will you leave behind? My philosophy professor was quite an eccentric character. He wore a threadbare, thick woolen coat and glasses that drooped down to the tip of his nose, almost covering his face, which only highlighted his unkempt appearance. Sometimes he would start a discussion on topics that few seemed interested in, like, what is the meaning of life? These discussions often didn't conclude with a clear answer, but sometimes they had a profound impact. Take, for example, this story I'm about to share. Who can tell me about their parents? He asked the class. Everyone raised their hand. How about your grandparents? About three quarters of the class raised their hand. Now, who can tell me about their great grandparents? Only two out of 60 students raised their hand. Think about this, he said, just two generations back, and very few of you know who your great-grandparents were. Maybe you've seen a faded photo in an old, moldy cigar box, or heard a typical family story like a relative who walked five miles to school. But how many of you really know what your ancestors thought, feared, or dreamed of? Think about it. In just three generations, most of our predecessors are forgotten. Could that happen to you? Let me make this more specific, he continued. Imagine three generations after you. By then, you'll long be gone. This spot where you sit will belong to your great-grandchildren. Will they know anything about you? Or will you too have disappeared into the past? He added, Do you want your life to be a cautionary tale or a source of inspiration for future generations? What legacy will you leave? The choice is entirely up to you. Let's take a break now. But nobody in our class got up to leave as usual. Everyone stayed seated thinking about what he had said. 14. Quiet Reflections One morning I woke up feeling really down and discouraged as if life had no favors to offer me. I wondered why I kept facing one misfortune after another. Weighed down by these thoughts, I slowly made my way to the bus stop, not really paying attention to the world waking up around me or the early morning sunlight. On the bus, I glanced across the aisle and saw a young girl with a pretty face and sparkling eyes. She nodded and smiled brightly at me. There was something about her that just drew people in. She greeted everyone warmly. Suddenly, I felt a pang of envy and wished I could be as cheerful as she was. When we reached the last stop, everyone quickly got off the bus, but the girl moved slowly. I looked back and was shocked to realize she was using wooden crutches to walk. Yet she seemed unfazed by it. As she passed by me, she looked up and smiled warmly. I couldn't forget that joyful and innocent smile. After a stressful day at work, I stopped by a grocery store to pick up some food. A 14-year-old boy was helping his mom at the store. He had a chubby face and a high, intelligent forehead. He tilted his head and smiled as he handed me my neatly packed bag. Before leaving, I affectionately ruffled his hair and asked his name. He just shook his head shyly and looked at his mom, as if trying to say something. He can't speak, ma'am his mother softly explained for him. Crossing the street, I encountered another boy with stunning black eyes, standing alone at a corner, watching other kids playing nearby, laughing along with them. I approached and asked, why don't you join them? He didn't respond, his gaze fixed ahead. I realized then that he couldn't hear me. I am truly blessed to have a healthy and able body. 
With strong legs, I can go anywhere I want. With clear eyes, I can admire my loved ones and the beautiful life around. With open ears, I can enjoy the wonderful sounds of life. With a smiling mouth, I am so happy to express love to my family and friends, sharing life's ups and downs. With all these, I can overcome any difficulty. I have everything. Therefore, I will live my life worthy of the blessings that life has given me. In this challenging journey of life, my friends and I, we all face hardships. Be ready to embrace what life brings and strive to overcome all challenges. Believe in and accept life with optimism and strong faith like those lovely kids. And today, those kids taught me a lesson about self-worth and the meaning of the fortunate life I have. 15. Two Notes of Love One Friday morning, a man, after a challenging probation period at a company, went to meet his boss to find out if he was going to be hired. Before leaving, he shared his concerns with his wife, expressing doubt that everything would go smoothly. He looked nervous and anxious. After the meeting, his boss agreed to hire him, and he couldn't hide his joy. He returned home feeling ecstatic and full of life. In their cozy little room, the table was beautifully set with exquisite glass plates and twinkling candles. His wife had prepared this celebration to commemorate his special day. He guessed that a kind-hearted colleague had told her the good news. He went to the kitchen, excitedly recounted the day's events to his wife, and delighted in seeing her eyes sparkle with happiness. They danced together to soft music before sitting down to eat. Under his plate, he found a small card. Congratulations, my love. I knew you could do it. This dinner is just for us, and I want to say I love you. After finishing the main course, he volunteered to tidy up the dessert in the kitchen. Suddenly, he saw another card that had fallen behind the refrigerator. It read, Don't be sad about not getting the job. Don't lose heart. Keep looking for work. This dinner is just for us, and I want to say that I always love you. 16. Quiet Moments Sometimes we only realize how much something meant to us when it's out of reach. It's in these moments that we truly understand its value and significance. Love someone with all your heart without expecting anything in return. Don't rush for love to happen. Instead, patiently wait until it blossoms in their heart. If it doesn't, find peace knowing it was already in yours. It may only take a minute to be smitten by someone, an hour to like them, and a day to love them, but it takes a lifetime to forget them. Don't judge by appearances, as they can be deceiving. Don't chase after material wealth, as it can be lost. Look for someone who makes you smile, because only a smile can turn a gloomy day bright. There are times in life when you miss someone so much that you wish you could pull them from your dreams into reality. Dream what you wish to dream. Go where you wish to go. Do what you desire to do. Be who you want to be because you have only one life and one chance to do all the things you dream of. Put yourself in someone else's shoes. If you would feel hurt in their situation, they likely would too. The happiest people don't necessarily have the best of everything. They are the ones who make the best of whatever life throws at them. Happiness comes to those who cry when hurt, feel pain when they suffer loss, nurture their dreams and strive to rebuild after failure. Only through these experiences can people truly appreciate the love and life they have and will have. Love starts with a smile, grows with a kiss, and often ends with tears. Whether these tears are of joy or sorrow, the love will leave you with profound and memorable experiences, marking the soul and aiding in personal growth. A bright future always stands on a forgotten past. You can't move forward in life until you let go of past failures and sorrows and learn from them. 17. Values in life. Opportunities for success come to everyone. 
Not everyone will love or understand you as you hope. However, cherish the moments you have with them and express your feelings, because there might not be another chance to do so. Mistakes do not define your value or character. Be brave in facing your own mistakes and accepting others' flaws, as no one is perfect. The key is never to repeat the same mistakes in similar situations. Accept things as they naturally are. There's no reason to get angry when you can't change a situation to fit your way of thinking, and there's no reason to like everything. But you can still live with these things, control your emotions and actions. No one else can decide how you feel, only you. If you have a bad day, it's because you made it that way. But if you believe your day will be better, then it will indeed be wonderful. Always try hard, especially when facing difficulties that seem insurmountable. You can't solve other people's problems for them, but your care, encouragement, and support are vital to help them overcome. It's never too late, never hopeless, never a complete dead end as long as you keep trying and believe. 18. The Business Card My brother Dave always wanted to be close to our grandmother. Both shared a boundless love for Mother Nature, including the vegetables and potato shoots they nurtured together in the small garden behind the house. Whenever he had time, Dave would visit her and enjoy a cup of coffee. One day, when he came over and didn't find her at home, he left a handful of soil on the porch. Although her tough childhood in Italy didn't allow her to have a full education, she still managed to build a good life in America. She lived healthily and independently, always knowing how to fully embrace life. Recently, she suffered a stroke and passed away. Everyone deeply mourned her loss. For Dave, nothing could comfort him. His lifelong friend was no longer there. At her funeral, Dave and I were among the grandchildren who stood by her coffin. At the cemetery, the officiant instructed us to place the white gloves and carnations we wore during the service on top of her coffin. As each grandchild took turns to pay their respects, Dave went before me. As he approached the coffin, I saw him quickly bend down to place something. I didn't see what it was, so I didn't pay much attention. When it was my turn to place my gloves and flowers next to where Dave had been, Tears welled up in my eyes as I saw the small handful of soil lying there on her coffin. It was the last time he left his business card for our beloved grandmother. 19. If I could live again, I would smile more at my own misfortunes and learn to quietly share in others' pain. I would spend more time appreciating the happiness I have and worry less about my flaws. If I had another chance at life, I would walk in the rain more often. I would linger in quiet, small towns instead of always being in tall buildings in big cities. I would try to understand children as they are and reduce my own demands on them. I would visit libraries and bookstores and go online to seek new knowledge. I would enjoy playing the piano more than engaging in mindless and thoughtless games. I would offer my family more tender, loving care instead of harsh directions. If I lived again, I would focus more on what's important right now rather than dwelling on the past or speculating about the future. I would become deeply aware of the values that are closest to my heart and the purposes of life. I would be less irritable and smile more. I would learn to be more forgiving hope for more forgiveness from others, and refrain from wishing misfortune on my enemies. Above all, I would not restrict myself. I would live more energetically, reduce hesitation and indifference. When a grand idea or an exciting risk suddenly emerges, I wouldn't sit still with the thought, that's not in my plans. I would get excited, stand up strong, and say, yes, let's get started. 20. Wedding Gift I carefully picked out the flowers for my wedding bouquet, making sure to include blooms that held special meanings. These included my fiancé's favorite, the bird of paradise, white roses representing purity, and strands of evergreen vines symbolizing fidelity. 
Midway through the wedding reception, as I was happily chatting with friends amidst a, a sea of flowers and champagne, suddenly someone touched my shoulder. Turning around, I recognized a woman I had briefly met earlier, a friend of my mother-in-law. She was holding a long tendril of the evergreen vine. It fell from your bouquet on the dance floor, she said. I thanked her and reached out to take it when she continued, May I keep this piece of vine? I was taken aback. How could a near stranger ask for a part of the bride's bouquet in the middle of the wedding? It wasn't even time for the bouquet toss. What did she want with my vine? I thought it over calmly. Tomorrow I would leave for my honeymoon and couldn't take the bouquet with me. It would probably end up discarded with the wrapping paper and other wedding debris. Why not let it go? I had given away so much already today. Please feel free, I replied with a genuine smile, proud of handling such an odd request gracefully. As the music started again, I moved away from the crowd, not giving the matter any more thought. A few months later, the doorbell rang. Opening the door, I was surprised to see the woman from my wedding. I hadn't seen her since that day. What now? I have a wedding gift for you, she said handing me a pot with a small, lush vine with vibrant green leaves. I immediately understood. It's the vine you dropped at your wedding, she explained. It looked healthy, so I potted it for you. I was speechless with emotion. This was the most precious wedding gift I had received. Twenty years have passed, and I am now a mother of three sons. Someday they will marry, and as a mother-in-law... I'll suggest that my daughters-in-law include a bit of the evergreen vine in their wedding bouquets, and I know just the plant to take it from in my garden. 21. Things I've Learned from Life I've learned that caring for others might seem simple, but is one of the hardest things to truly show. I've learned that sharing in someone's pain during their moments of despair makes me feel meaningful. I've realized that loving others and giving hope enriches my own love for life. I've discovered that healing emotional wounds is just as critical as treating physical illnesses. I've figured out that if I don't know how to take care of myself, I won't know how to care for others. I've realized that quiet moments alone in a hospital give us a chance to reflect on our past and improve our future. I've learned that our bodies listen to what we say. If you maintain positive thoughts and an optimistic attitude, your health will benefit. I've understood that true love for someone means caring for them without expecting anything in return. I've seen that time silently passes, whether I am happy and optimistic or sunk in despair. I've learned that we may not be able to change reality, but it's crucial to find our path and not just passively wait in discontent. I've learned that the greatest success is helping others discover their potential. I've realized that the most important thing isn't to focus on life's complexities, but to clearly define and take the necessary steps toward our goals. I've understood that forgiveness is never too much, but even a little bit of criticism and fault-finding can be too much. I've learned that the sincerity of the speaker is more important than their words. I've learned that each day brings challenges, but we should also grasp the good that might never come again. I've deeply felt that everyone has the ability to transform their pain and worries into genuine joy and happiness. 22. Thought-Provoking Ideas Anyone aiming for success needs to learn to view failure as a natural and inevitable part of reaching greater heights. Joyce Brothers emphasized this, saying, Those who want to succeed must learn to view failure as a healthy, unavoidable part of the process of reaching for greatness. The movie Star Wars was initially turned down by several Hollywood studios before 20th Century Fox decided to produce it. It went on to become one of the highest grossing films in world cinema history. Other films like E.T., Forrest Gump, Home Alone, Speed, and Pulp Fiction 
were also initially rejected by major studios before finding a producer willing to take them on. One studio decided not to invest in Gone with the Wind because they believed no movie about the American Civil War had ever made a profit. Sylvester Stallone grew up in a strict household, often beaten and belittled by his father, calling him stupid. He had a lonely and difficult childhood, moving schools frequently. After reviewing his test results at Drexel University, one of his teachers suggested he might have a future in elevator repair. Tom Watson, the founder of IBM, supported one of his vice presidents in promoting a new product with great potential. Unfortunately, the project was a risky venture and led to a $10 million loss. When the vice president came to resign, embarrassed by the failure, Watson responded, Are you kidding? We just spent $10 million educating you. For those who use old age as an excuse to step back from life's challenges and give up on their dreams, consider the following. Famed painter. Grandma Moses didn't start painting until she was 76 years old. Ruth Gordon won an Academy Award for Rosemary's Baby at the age of 72. Golda Meir was elected Prime Minister of Israel when she was 71 years old. Finally, if you think your vote doesn't matter and it's okay not to vote, reflect on these historical moments. In 1645, Oliver Cromwell won control of England by just one vote over his opponent. In 1649, King Charles Meir of England was executed after losing by one vote. In 1875, one vote elevated France from a monarchy to a republic. In 1976, Rutherford B. Hayes became president of the United States by a margin of just one vote. 23. The Pearl and the Dream In the last week of the school year, Mr. York, our science teacher, gathered the 20 students in my class to say goodbye for the summer. We sat in silence as he walked into the room. He looked the same as always with his small bow tie and horn-rimmed glasses. After a few words, he handed each of us a small white box. Inside, he said, you will find a silver petal with a pearl in the center. This pearl represents your potential, something you will need for your future. Just like sand becomes a valuable pearl inside an oyster shell, you hold the seed for your potential. I bit my lip hard to stop my tears. His words meant so much, but for me, it was all too late, ever since I found out I was pregnant. My dreams and my mother's dreams vanished because I had ruined my student life in a moment of weakness. How could I forget the endless sacrifices of my mother, who just wanted me to earn a college degree? Every week she scraped together some money for my sister Marianne and me. College was the only way out of the poverty of our coal mining town in Pennsylvania, she always said. My childhood memories of hardship are vivid. When I was three, my father had to enter a sanatorium due to tuberculosis. Years later, he was discharged, living aimlessly unable to work. Our family relied on my mother's meager salary. From these hardships, a dream grew in my mother's mind. Marianne and I must go to college. And now, instead of pride, I brought shame home. Dan and I got married, and while he continued with college, I had to drop out. Before Dan graduated, I gave birth to our second child. Later, Dan joined the military, and I moved with him from one base to another. Our third child was born. Seven years later, Dan was discharged, found a job, but it wasn't enough to support us, so I had to work multiple jobs, overwhelmed with endless worries. One night, as I looked at the pearl, I thought of Mr. York's words. At 35, I tossed and turned, contemplating returning to school. My mother must have sensed my turmoil because one day she called, Do you remember the money I've been saving for you? It's still there. I stared blankly at the phone, 17 years, and she still held on to that dream. Finally, six months later, I enrolled in a nearby university studying education. Balancing family and school was harder than I expected. One May day, 
After my first year, I came home and cried, uncertain if I could complete the program. My eldest daughter was preparing for college that fall. Family finances were tight. School expenses for both of us were mounting. Days later, I ran into Mrs. York at the dentist's office. I shared my struggles and my attempt to return to school, facing many obstacles. I understand, Mrs. York said. Mr. York started college at 50. I listened, surprised, especially as she described the hardships Mr. York endured to pursue his education. The story of Mr. York gave me strength and resolve. I finished the remaining three years of college. After graduating, I taught English at a local high school. My difficult years provided valuable life lessons and specific learning methods, which I brought into the classroom. At the end of the year, the principal announced surprising news. I was nominated for a National Best Teacher Award. In my report, I recounted how Mr. York's Pearl had influenced me. In September, I received that prestigious honor. Interestingly, later, Mr. York and I were invited for an interview. Meeting him again, I was moved hearing him say he would retire next year. He even shared that he once thought of dropping out because I didn't believe in the future, I didn't believe in myself. I asked him if when he gave us the pearls, he didn't believe in the 20 students in our class. He replied, no, I saw each of you as valuable pearls. 24. Please forgive me. Throughout my middle school years, I was consistently at the bottom of my class, which made me lose interest in studying. At that age, even if I stayed home, I wouldn't have done much, just loafed around. So, my aunt and uncle sent me to school as a way to get rid of me. After my grandmother passed away and my mom disappeared, the harsh neglect from my aunt and the beatings from my uncle turned me into a tough, stubborn, and some might say disrespectful kid. No one really taught me anything. No one in school wanted to be friends with a poor, bad student who was quick to anger. The teachers eventually gave up on me, too. If it weren't for you, I don't know what would have become of my life. I finally found some itching powder at the cemetery and decided to put it on your chair in the classroom. Honestly, I didn't dislike you. You were pretty and kind. But I was angry because of the beating my uncle gave me the day before, and I told myself I was going to get revenge because you had told him about something I did. Watching you uncomfortable and restless made me feel a thrill. Before leaving class, you looked at me for a long time, at least it seemed that way, and I think there might have been a tear in your eye. You said in a heavy voice, You all are still very young. Making mistakes is natural, but before you do something, remember, it will really upset me. That look and your heartfelt words changed my life. Alone, I worked and studied hard, struggling for over 15 years just to make ends meet. Sometimes, I felt so tired and thought about giving up, but then I would remember your words and your look, your kindness in those nights when I shivered studying at your place with just a bowl of rice porridge with a bit of sugar and a glass of cold water kept me going. When I was eight, my mom remarried and never came back. For me, the concept of mother is vague. You are the only person I truly respect. I was determined that one day, when I made something of myself, I would come back and apologize to you on my knees, to tell you about the student you visited so many times, the one you had to vouch for to the school so he wouldn't get disciplined for his impudence, the one who put itching powder on your chair, and also the one who cried when he received a brand new white shirt from you at the start of 10th grade. I did not let you down. I have achieved almost everything I wanted in life, but I will never get to apologize to you. You did not wait to hear my apology. For the rest of my life, I will never have the chance to ask for your forgiveness. My teacher, you have gone far away too soon. 25. Everyone can fly. There was a little boy who grew up in an orphanage. He always dreamed of flying like the birds. No matter how anyone explained it to him, he just couldn't understand why he couldn't fly, 
especially when he saw larger birds flying at the zoo. There was another boy who had been paralyzed from a young age. His only dream was to be able to walk and run like other kids. He frequently asked his dad why he couldn't walk. One day, the boy from the orphanage went out and visited a park. There, he saw the paralyzed boy playing in a sandbox. He ran over and asked him if he had ever dreamed of flying. I've never dreamed of that, the paralyzed boy replied, but I always wish I could walk like you. I'm sorry to hear that. It's really sad. Hey, can we be friends? Of course. The two boys played happily until the paralyzed boy's dad brought his wheelchair to take him home. The boy who dreamed of flying whispered something into his friend's dad's ear. Sure, if you want to, the dad smiled. The boy approached his friend and said, You're my only friend. I wish there was a miracle that could make you walk. I can only do this little thing for you. Then he lifted his paralyzed friend onto his back and started walking. Gradually, he began to run faster. The paralyzed boy cheered excitedly. Thank you. This is the first time I don't need a wheelchair. The boy who wanted to fly ran even faster. His face flushed and his shirt drenched with sweat. The happy father watched the two kids running around the grass. The paralyzed boy threw his hands in the air and shouted, Dad, look, I can fly now. I'm flying. This heartwarming story of two boys reminds us, if you can't fly, you can still help others fly. Just like if you can't fulfill your own dreams, you can help someone else achieve theirs. And you can still be happy doing it. 26. If I were you. If I were a boy and you were a girl, I would tell you how beautiful you are every day, whether it's true or not, and I would give a stern look to anyone who dares to criticize you. I would always hold your hand in crowded places, not because I'm afraid you might get lost, but so everyone can see and admire that we are in love. I would sit quietly and watch you cry, handing you tissues when we watch sad movies, even if I don't find the scenes tear-worthy at all. I would take you out for ice cream, desserts, and all the things girls love and boys typically don't. I'd eat with you, not just watch, even if the food isn't great because I know you don't like eating alone. I would try to use all my boy brain power to notice if you're wearing a new shirt or if you've cut your hair by an inch, even though most of the time, this effort is futile. I would compliment your hair when you ask if it's gotten longer, even if it looks the same because I know how much you want it to grow. I'd excitedly wake up at 4 a.m. to get you up for work even if I woke up without knowing what to do. I would listen to you talk about all sorts of things and people I've never even heard of with all the focus of a guy. I would always be honest. If one morning I wake up and feel that you're no longer in my heart, I would call you and say, hey, I think we should go our separate ways. I would never make promises about the distant future, like five or ten years from now. I only promise what I can do because I know girls don't like empty promises. I would never swear to do everything for you, but I would do it anyway. If I were a boy and you were a girl, that's how it would be. So if I am a girl and you are a boy, what would it be like? 27. Tears from the Sky On a cold winter evening, as Fiametta sat by the fireplace with her husband, she suddenly asked, What is rain, dear? Outside, the weather was awful with raindrops tapping against the window pane. Fiametta repeated her question, gently shaking her husband's hand. Honey, what is rain? Rain, my love? It means the sky is crying he replied. But why would the sky cry? Well, it's not exactly the sky crying. It's more like the tears of all the sad people in the world coming together to form clouds. All those tears, really? Not all, but most of them. The raindrops falling from the sky are from those who are sad and have no one to comfort them. If they were comforted, those tears would stay inside and be treasured like a precious collection in their hearts.
But why is there so much rain? It means that these days many people are crying, but there are too few to comfort them. So how do we stop the rain? Do I have to comfort everyone in the world to make it sunny tomorrow? Just comforting one person is enough, right when they are crying, when you meet them. But I'm not sure if you can do that. Then tonight, I will place many glasses on the windowsill to catch the rain, and I will return it to its rightful owners, those who have been sad and crying. But how can you return each tear to the right person? They don't have their names on them. Fiametta didn't have an answer for her husband's question, but she knew there was a way. The next morning, she patiently placed each drop on her palm and looked inside. Each tiny crystal drop always held a face. 28. The Resilience of the Cactus Have you ever spent time observing a cactus and wondered, how can a cactus survive in any weather? Well, a cactus may not be as visually striking as a rose. It doesn't emit a strong fragrance like lilies, nor does it have the purity of a lotus flower blooming in the mud. Instead, it often looks rugged with its sharp thorns and bulky shape. But beneath its unattractive appearance lies a vibrant life force, unmatched by any other flower. Growing up, my family had a small garden filled with various flowers, white roses, chrysanthemums, bellflowers, and, of course, a cactus. Every evening, I used to stroll in the garden. I noticed that all the flowers would wilt due to the intense heat, except the cactus, which always remained fresh. Since then, I've grown fond of the cactus because it taught me an important lesson. Even if I'm not as fortunate as others, I must live a meaningful life. So, if you ever feel down about not being very lucky, just look at the cactus. It remains vibrant, whether it's planted in arid soil or on a sunny, windy sandbank. The cactus thrives despite the weather challenges, harboring a fierce will to grow and bring some greenery into the world. 29. Why we live. Three people looking quite sad came to seek advice from a wise philosopher on how to live a happier life. First, tell me what do you live for, the philosopher asked. The first person said, I live because I don't want to die. The second person said, I live because I want to see if tomorrow will be better than today. The third person said, I live because I have a family to take care of. I can't die. The philosopher shook his head and said, Well, that's exactly why you aren't happy. You live out of fear, waiting, and forced responsibility, not because of a genuine purpose. 30. The glass and water. The glass said, I feel so lonely, I need some water. Please give me some water. The owner asked, Okay. If I give you water, you won't feel lonely anymore, right? The glass replied, I guess so. The owner brought the water and poured it into the glass. The water was very hot, and the glass felt its body soften and weaken, almost as if it were going to melt. The glass thought, this must be the power of love. After a while, the water cooled to a warm temperature, and the glass felt incredibly comfortable. The glass thought, this is what life tastes like. As the water turned cold, the glass began to feel afraid, unsure of what it was afraid of. The glass thought, this is the taste of loss. When the water became ice cold, the glass felt hopeless. The glass thought, this must be fate's arrangement. The glass cried out, owner, pour out the water. I don't need it anymore. But the owner wasn't there. The glass felt suffocated. The icy water was unbearable, lingering inside, making it uncomfortable. The glass shook itself violently. Finally, the water spilled out. Before the glass could feel relieved, it toppled to the floor and shattered. As it lay broken, the glass saw every piece of itself had traces of water. Only then did the glass realize it truly loved the water. But now... There was no way to keep the water inside anymore. 
The glass cried, its tears mingling with the water. It tried to love the water one last time with the little strength it had left. The owner returned. He picked up the pieces and one shard cut his finger, drawing blood. The glass thought, what is love, really? Must we go through pain to appreciate it? The glass thought, what is love, if not something that makes us lose everything, with no way to recover before we finally let go? 31. Talking to my child about paths. The image of paths has always fascinated me, as in each of our lives there are so many paths. Some paths wind and twist. Some paths are rugged and uneven. Some paths are smooth and clean. Some paths are narrow and covered with fallen leaves. Some paths shimmer beautifully in the sunlight, as if straight out of a fairy tale. And some paths are bare and cold. But no matter the path, I love capturing their images. Photos of paths are not just reminders of warm memories from past experiences. They also inspire a deep passion for upcoming journeys of discovery. With so many paths, there will be times when you need to make a choice. Sometimes life, or our own desire for new experiences, will force us to leave the old path and face many new ones, making us think about which one to take next. If you ever find yourself facing many paths like this, stay calm and bravely choose one to continue your journey confidently. And once you've decided, never second-guess yourself. March forward, enjoy the thrill of discovery, and overcome any obstacles along the way. Don't regret your choice, because even if a path doesn't bring what you hoped for, it still offers rich experiences and valuable lessons for choosing your next path. Soon enough, you'll be mature enough to choose your own path. You might continue on one path forever, or you might travel back and forth on many paths before reaching your desired destination. But whatever path you take, I hope you always feel confident in your choices and excited to explore and discover new things, as these are the true rewards for anyone who ventures onto a new path. 32. Words from a Mother Saturday, July 1st. Dear Enrico, the school year has ended. You will soon have to say goodbye to your teacher and your friends. Unfortunately, I have some sad news. This farewell isn't just for two and a half months. It's for a lifetime. Your father's job requires us to move from Turin, and naturally, we will all move with him. By autumn, we will be relocating. You will attend a new school. That must be upsetting, isn't it? I know you're fond of your old school, where you've happily studied twice a day for four years, seeing your teachers and friends every day and where your mom and I stood waiting for you. You will miss the place where your intellect expanded, where you made good friends, and where every conversation was beneficial to you. Carry these memories with you and say your goodbyes to your friends with genuine warmth from your heart. Sadly, some of your friends have also experienced misfortune, like losing parents early or battling illnesses. Some might even serve their country on the battlefield. However, most will become respectable, hard-working craftsmen and diligent, caring fathers who might one day take on significant responsibilities and become well-known. Say farewell to your friends dearly and leave a part of your heart in that great family of a school. When you first joined, you were a child, and now you leave as a young adult, loved and cherished by everyone there. Enrico, a school is like a mother who took you from our hands when you could barely speak and returned to us a healthy, kind, and diligent child. May God bless such a merciful mother. Remember this benefactor always. As you grow and see the world, you may see grand cities and majestic castles, but always remember the simple white house with its shutters and green garden, where the first flower of your intellect bloomed. I believe that the image of your old school will remain in your memory until your last breath, just as I will never forget the house where I first heard your voice. Love, Mom. 33. Dad's Letter 
This morning, while my teacher, Miss Den, was visiting, my dad noticed that I was disrespectful to my mom. Because of this, he wrote me the following letter, which was very touching. Enrico, in front of your teacher, you were disrespectful to your mom. Please don't do that again. Your rude behavior deeply hurt me like a knife through my heart. I remember, years ago, how your mom stayed up all night by your bedside, listening to your breathing, worrying over you. Every time she thought about losing you, she would cry. Remember those times, and do not be harsh to your mom, who would gladly give up a year of happiness just to spare you an hour of pain, who would beg if it meant providing for you, and who would sacrifice her life to save yours. There will be days in your life filled with sadness, but the saddest day will be the day you lose your mom. As you grow up, your struggles will make you stronger. You will always remember your mom and you will wish to hear her gentle voice and see her kind face again. No matter how big or strong you become, you will still feel like a lost and vulnerable child. You will recall times when you hurt her and you will feel regret. The gentle and loving image of your mom will only make you sadder. Remember, being respectful to your parents is a sacred duty. Anyone who disrespects this principle is contemptible. Even a murderer, if they respect their parents, retains some integrity. But a person, no matter how grand who hurts their mom or disrespects her, lacks character. Enrico I beg you to let your mom kiss you and erase the ungrateful mark from your forehead. I still love you deeply because you are the most precious hope of my life, but I would rather be childless than have a child who betrays his mother. 34. Party in the Bathroom She was a housekeeper, working for a very wealthy man in his fifties. At night, after finishing her duties, she would rush back to her small, run-down house where her eager five-year-old son waited. One evening, her employer hosted a large gathering, inviting many friends and guests for a nighttime party. He asked her, Can you stay later tonight due to the workload? She replied, Yes, but my little boy will be scared being home alone for too long. The employer kindly suggested, Bring him along then. She brought her son, telling him on the way that he was going to a night party. Excited, he had no idea what being a housekeeper entailed, nor did she want to expose him to the harsh realities of wealth disparity at such a young age. She quietly bought two sausages. As the guests arrived, the house buzzed with polite conversations and grandeur. Overwhelmed, she couldn't keep a close watch on her scruffy son, fearing he might disrupt the party. Eventually, she found a solution. She took him to the unused bathroom of the house, a quiet place away from the festivities. She placed the sausages on a porcelain plate, cheerfully telling him, This room is just for you. The party starts now. And asked him to stay there until she could take him home. The boy was delighted by the room for him, clean and beautiful beyond anything he'd seen. Sitting on the floor, he began eating the sausages and softly sang to himself, celebrating his own little party. As the night went on, the host remembered about the boy and found the housekeeper in the kitchen. She hesitated when asked where her son was, hinting she wasn't sure. Concerned, the host quietly went looking and, upon hearing singing from the bathroom, he opened the door, astonished to find the boy there. The boy brightly explained, my mom said this is my special room for the party, but I wish someone would join me. Moved to tears by the situation, the host sat down with the boy. He returned to the main party to inform the guests that he would be busy entertaining a special guest of his own for the evening. He brought a plate of food to the bathroom, knocked politely, and joined the boy. They sat on the floor, enjoying the food and chatting happily, even singing together. Soon, other guests, touched by the warmth of their interaction, began visiting the bathroom to greet and join them in singing children's songs. It was a sincere and warm experience for everyone. Years later, the boy, now a successful and wealthy man, never forgot his 
humble beginnings nor the kindness of the old employer. He remained committed to helping those in need, embodying the compassion and dignity he was shown as a five-year-old. 35. Is the bird blind or are we misunderstanding? In the garden of a certain writer there was a thick, evergreen persimmon tree. From his writing room through a glass door he could see this tree. His routine was to wake up early each day to write, and he was quite surprised when, for a while, a bird kept crashing into his door every morning. Day after day he began to wonder, just like me, could it be that the bird was blind or suffering from some illness? As days continued without a satisfying explanation, he decided one day to step outside his room, stand near the bird, and face the glass door to look into the room. He couldn't believe his eyes. Before him was a breathtaking sight. The persimmon tree was shimmering green, reflected on the glass as though it were in a far away, larger and deeper space. And he realized the little bird had grown tired of its familiar daily tree when it suddenly discovered another persimmon tree. It had crashed into it, hoping to find a more beautiful, sparkling place. This story made me think about a few things. Sometimes, by not standing in someone else's position, we fail to understand them. And sometimes we do not realize that what we already have is what is truly important and the real happiness of our lives, yet we keep chasing after elusive things. But perhaps it is only in our illusions that we find happiness, because reality often doesn't live up to our expectations, forcing us to escape from it. 36. The Small Frying Pan Two friends went fishing together. One of them would put each fish he caught into his cooler to keep it fresh. The other friend, however, threw back every large fish he caught. Surprised by this, the first friend asked, Why do you keep throwing all the big fish back into the river? The second friend replied, Because the frying pan at my home is really small. This story could be seen as a funny anecdote, but it actually mirrors how we sometimes act, giving up on big plans, dreams, and opportunities because of our limited beliefs. We laugh at the fishermen for not just getting a bigger frying pan, but are we ready to expand our own beliefs to chase our dreams? 37. Adaptation Once, a frog was placed into a pot of cold water. This pot wasn't covered and it was set on a stove. At first, the water was still cold and the frog didn't react. As the water gradually warmed up, the frog didn't notice. Why? Because the temperature increased slowly, allowing the frog to get used to it. As time went on, the water got hotter, but the frog still didn't notice because the temperature only rose gradually. By the time the water boiled, the frog began to feel uncomfortable but by then, it was too late. The frog ended up being boiled in the pot. This is a classic story about change. The water heated up so gradually that the frog didn't notice and ended up dying in boiling water. Suppose if the frog had been thrown into already hot water and the pot wasn't covered, it surely would have jumped out. Life is similar for us humans. We get used to the everyday events and don't want to change or even fear change, and the new. But in reality, our lives change every day, and if we don't pay attention, it's too late. When faced with a significant change, we panic and fear. Can we then handle the change? Can we accept it, or is it too late by then? Always be prepared for any change. Pay close attention to everything happening around you. Face and accept the changes happening so you can adjust accordingly. 38. The One-String Violin In the 19th century, Niccolo Paganini, a highly skilled and expressive violinist, was performing a challenging piece in a packed concert hall. A full orchestra accompanied him. Suddenly, one of the violin strings snapped and dangled from his bow. Sweat poured from his forehead. Though worried, he continued to play beautifully. 
a second string broke, surprising the conductor, and soon after, a third string snapped. Now, with three broken strings swaying on his violin, this master musician finished the climax of the piece with just one remaining string. The audience stomped their feet and, in true Italian fashion, filled the hall with cheers of bravo. As the applause died down, the violinist asked everyone to sit. Though they knew there seemed no way for him to perform the remainder, the audience silently took their seats. He lifted his violin high for all to see. He nodded to the conductor to begin again and then turned to face the crowd. With a bright sparkle in his eye, he smiled and declared loudly, This is Paganini on one string. Then he placed his one-string Stradivarius under his chin and played the final part. The audience shook their heads in utter amazement. Our lives are often filled with complications, worries, disappointments, and imperfections. Honestly, we spend most of our time focused on and fretting over the broken strings and the unexpected, all of which are beyond our control. Are you still grieving over the broken strings in your life? Do you think you can't make beautiful music with what's left? If so, let me encourage you not to lose heart, but to continue and start playing again with just one string. Let it sing a sweet melody that the world longs to hear, full of spontaneity. You can do it if you want to. 39. Let Life Teach You In a small pond, there was a group of water striders, Every day they would climb up the reeds to enjoy the sunshine. Occasionally they would see a strange object flying down towards them, quickly hiding underwater and then climb back up once it had passed. They would excitedly ask each other, what is that object? One of them said, if only we could fly, then we would know what it is and what life is like out there. One day, one of the water striders found its way to the top of a reed and stayed there for a long time. Its body began to change. It put on a brightly colored coat and crystal clear wings emerged from its back. The water strider had transformed into a beautiful dragonfly. It gently flapped its wings and soared into the air, joyfully circling in the sunlit sky. Suddenly remembering a promise it had made, it returned to look for its old friends to tell them about its journey. The dragonfly swooped down to the water's surface, but no matter how hard it tried, it could no longer get close to its friends. It was no longer a water strider like before. The other water striders, seeing the dragonfly return, hid in fear. So it thought to itself, What can I do? I've tried my best to keep my promise, but even in my dazzling new form, I think they'll just have to wait until they can climb up the reeds themselves to discover where I've been and what I've become. People with different thoughts or those who exceed others in experience are often not accepted or are misunderstood. And for that reason, if you find yourself in that situation, let life teach them. 40. If and Then if the sky looks full of gray clouds and you step outside into the rain, if you're hoping to see a brilliant rainbow, but its colors bring you sadness, if the earth keeps spinning, but you feel like you're reaching the end, if you're searching for sunlight, but all you see is darkness, if everything around you is joyous, but all you feel is sorrow, if you're incredibly tired and life keeps knocking you down, if you cry, then think of your tears as falling to the ground and creating the miracle of beautiful flowers, as gentle as if they were in your hand. Then breathe in the air around you, filled with the scent of freshly cut grass. Then play with children and embrace their innocence as they laugh and play. Then imagine yourself flying with a pretty butterfly in a colorful forest. Then listen to the whispers of the ocean and let your skin be caressed by the warm summer breeze. Then taste a piece of candy and savor the sweet memories of childhood melting on your tongue. Then listen to the clear melodies of birds singing to welcome a new day. Then remember the gentle comfort you received from your mother's tender kiss as she held you close 
and whispered words of endless love. Strive to find the beauty in life. Look up at the colorful clouds above, not the dark soil beneath your feet. Life doesn't just happen to us. We give life its meaning through our positive actions and thoughts. Start today, right this moment, because life itself is a joy, the greatest gift that nature has given you. 41. My Father When I was 16 years old, one morning my dad asked me to drive him to the remote village of Mijar, 18 miles from our home. He wanted me to take the car to a nearby garage for repairs. Since I had just started learning to drive and saw this as a great chance to practice, I immediately agreed. I drove my dad to the village and promised to pick him up at 4 p.m. before taking the car to the garage. With a few hours to spare, I decided to buy a ticket to a movie across the street. I got so caught up in the movie that I lost track of time, and by the time I checked my watch, it was already 6 p.m. I knew my dad would be upset when he found out I went to the movies and might never let me drive again, so I came up with a few more car troubles to explain why I was late. I drove to our meeting spot and saw my dad waiting patiently on the street corner. I apologized for being late and told him that I tried to come as soon as possible, but the car needed some additional repairs. I'll never forget the way he looked at me then. My dad was really disappointed because I had lied to him, Jason. What do you mean? That's the truth, Dad. He looked at me again. When you didn't show up on time, I called the garage to ask if there was a problem, and they said you hadn't come to pick up the car. The feeling of guilt overwhelmed me, and I confessed to my dad the real reason I was late. My dad was angry not at me, but at himself. He realized that he hadn't been a good father. After all these years, I still felt I had to lie to him. It's heartbreaking to raise a son who can't even be honest with his own father. Now I'm going to walk home and think about what I've been doing wrong all these years. But Dad, it's 18 miles home and it's already dark. You can't walk. All my protests and apologies were useless. I had let my father down and I also learned the most painful lesson of my life. He began walking down the dark, dusty, and windy road. I slowly drove behind him, hoping all the way he would forgive me, but my dad continued on, his figure silent and pensive. The image of my father walking wearily and in pain is something I will never forget, but it was also the most meaningful lesson because I have never lied to him since then. Kisteji, 42. Patriotism. My son's essay question this morning was, why do you love your country? He was deeply moved by the story of Uncle Lin playing the drum the other day, and I'm sure he wrote his essay effortlessly. Why do you love your country? Didn't that question spark a myriad of answers in your mind? I love my country because my mother was born there, because the blood in my veins is its blood, because the sacred ground there holds all the dearly departed my mother loved and my father respected because of the land I was born on, the language I speak, the books I learn from, my siblings, my friends, and the great nation I share life with, the beautiful landscapes created by nature that surround me. In summary, everything I see, everything I love and hold dear belongs to my country. Right now, you are young and might not fully grasp what it means to love your country, but you will understand one day. When you travel far and return, standing on the deck of a ship one morning and seeing the green mountains of your homeland on the horizon, you will feel tears of joy well up and cheers of joy escape your lips. You will feel patriotic when you are abroad and suddenly hear someone among the crew speak your native language. Instinctively, you will approach and strike up a conversation with this stranger. You will feel patriotic when you hear a foreigner insult your homeland, and anger will flush your cheeks. Your love for your country will grow even stronger and nobler if one day an enemy unjustly attacks our homeland. At that moment, you will see how your father encourages you to be brave, and how your mother bids you farewell, 
hoping for your triumphant return. You will feel patriotic when you see our troops returning, tired yet singing songs of victory. You will feel patriotic when you see our national flag, tattered from battle, leading a group of brave souls, each displaying bandaged foreheads or arms amid a joyful crowd throwing flowers and shouting praises. Enrico, my son, now you understand what patriotism is. It is something vast and sacred. For one day, when I hear that you returned from battle safely, but also that you had to hide to escape death, I will no longer greet you with a joyful laugh like I used to when you came home from school. Instead, I will greet you with tears of deep sorrow. I will no longer be able to look at you with the same affection and it will tear my heart apart. 43. Is there a dragonfly on your shoulder? In a small, peaceful, and beautiful city, two people deeply in love would go to the beach every dawn to watch the sunrise, and each evening they would see the sun set on the sandy shores. It seemed that everyone who saw this couple looked on with admiration. One day, after a car accident, the girl was severely injured and lay silently in a hospital bed, unresponsive for days and nights. In the morning, the boy sat by her bed in despair, calling out to his unconscious beloved. At night, he knelt in the city's small church, looking up to God, praying with eyes dry from crying. A month passed, the girl remained silent, and the boy's heart had long been shattered, but he still held on to hope and prayed. Then, one day, God was moved. God gave the struggling boy a chance, asking, Would you give your life in exchange? Without hesitation, the boy replied, I am willing. God said, I can awaken the one you love, but you must become a dragonfly for three years. Do you agree? The boy promptly responded, I agree. The next morning, as a dragonfly, he flew to the hospital like every morning, and the girl woke up. As a dragonfly, he couldn't be recognized by his love or hear what she was saying to the doctor by her bed. When the girl left the hospital, she was very sad. She searched everywhere for her love, but no one knew where he had gone. She searched for a long time, and the dragonfly never left her side, always fluttering around her. But as a dragonfly, he couldn't speak. And as a dragonfly, he was in front of his beloved, but not recognized. As summer turned to autumn and the cold wind blew the leaves from the trees, the dragonfly could not stay. Thus, the last fall of the dragonfly was on the girl's shoulder. I want to use my fragile wings to caress your face, to kiss your forehead with my dry lips, he thought. But his light, delicate form remained unnoticed by the girl. In a blink, spring arrived, and the dragonfly desperately flew back to the city searching for his love. But the familiar form of the girl now leaned against a strong, handsome man, and the dragonfly, in pain, fell swiftly from the sky. Everyone knew how severe the girl's condition had been after the accident, how wonderful and lovely the doctor was, how naturally their love developed, and how the girl had become happy again like before. The dragonfly was heartbroken. In the days that followed, he still saw the doctor taking the girl he loved to the aquarium to watch the sunrise, to the beach in the evening to watch the sunset, and the dragonfly could only occasionally rest on the girl's shoulder, unable to do more. The whispers of love, the sounds of happiness from the girl made the dragonfly suffocate. By the third summer, the dragonfly no longer visited the girl he loved as often. The doctor's arm was always around her, his kisses passionate on her face, and the girl had no time to think of a sad dragonfly or look back at the past. God's three years were almost up. On the last day, the dragonfly's former lover walked down the aisle to marry the doctor. The dragonfly quietly flew into the church, landed on the shoulder of the one he loved, knowing she was kneeling before God, saying, I am willing. He saw the doctor slip the ring on her finger. They kissed deeply 
passionately. A tear of pain fell from the dragonfly. God asked, Do you regret it now? The dragonfly wiped away the tear and said, I do not. Pleased, God said, Then from tomorrow you can become human again. The dragonfly looked at the tear and shook his head, replying, Let me remain a dragonfly for life. 44. The Story of a Frog a group of frogs was passing through a forest when two of them fell into a deep pit. Seeing how deep the pit was, the other frogs told the two that they would surely die. Despite these discouraging words, the two frogs ignored the comments and tried their best to jump out of the pit. The other frogs kept telling them to give up and accept their inevitable death. Eventually, one of the frogs listened to the others. Exhausted and hopeless, it collapsed and died. The other frog, however, continued to put all its remaining strength into jumping even higher. The frogs above continued to shout at it to lie down and wait for death. But the frog jumped even harder and, miraculously, finally managed to escape from the pit. The frogs gathered around and asked, Didn't you hear us? They kept asking in surprise and confusion. Finally, an old frog revealed that the frog who escaped was deaf and thought that the other frogs were cheering it on. 45. Scents that bring back memories. 1. It seems that everyone holds dear certain scents that they cherish and connect with. I have a fondness for the smell of cooking oil smoke. I'll never forget the indescribable feeling of nostalgia when I first moved into a dorm to attend college and smelled cooking oil again. I wondered why this scent was so impactful to me. The answer wasn't hard to find. As a young child, I lived with my mom in a small apartment where she cooked with an oil stove daily. The room was tiny, and despite placing the stove at one end, the smoke lingered. Perhaps that's why the scent became so familiar to me and why I've grown to love it. 2. A girlfriend of mine, on the other hand, likes the smell of gasoline, which usually gives people headaches. Strange, right? Her father was a driver. When she was little, her father often traveled for work. Whenever he returned from a long trip, she would sit in the cabin next to him for a ride and the smell of gasoline became a cherished memory for her. 3. If you've ever seen the movie Fifty First Dates, you might remember how Lucy Whitmore touched Henry Roth, a veterinarian at a marine park, deeply when she told him she loved the sea smell on him. She gently kissed his hands and said it was the nicest scent in the world. The reason was that her father and brother often went to sea and were away from home. When they returned, Lucy would hug them tightly and breathe in the briny scent of the sea from her loved ones. Some might think the scriptwriter exaggerated this detail, but I believe the filmmakers had a good reason for including it in the movie. 4. I've recently moved next to a rather troublesome neighbor who constantly complains about her husband and kids and picks fights with the neighbors. Everyone dislikes her. However, I found a reason not to be annoyed. She grows a trellis of lily buds in her yard. Early in the morning and at night, the sweet and gentle fragrance of the lily buds spreads, especially refreshing after a rain. Sometimes the scent is so strong that I find it hard to concentrate on reading. Then I drift into memories of summer breaks spent with my grandmother, who also had a trellis of lily buds. In the evenings, we would pick flowers and leaves to make crab soup. The fragrance and refreshing taste of the lily bud crab soup have stayed with me over the years, and now it even makes me tolerate my difficult neighbor. 46. Salt. A young man went to learn from an old teacher. He was always pessimistic and complained about every difficulty. To him, life was just a series of sorrows, so studying didn't seem any more appealing. One day, when the young man was lamenting about his lack of progress despite studying hard, the teacher listened silently and then handed him a spoonful of salt and a small glass of water. 
Put this spoonful of salt in the glass of water and taste it, the teacher instructed. The young man did as told and tasted the water, which was bitter and salty. The teacher then took him to a nearby lake and poured a spoonful of salt into it. Now try tasting the water from the lake, he said. The water in the lake is still fresh, the young man replied after scooping some and tasting it. The teacher slowly said, My son, everyone faces hardships similar to this spoon of salt, but each person dissolves it differently. Those with open hearts like the lake do not let sorrows take away their joy and zest for life. However, those whose hearts are as small as a glass of water will turn their lives bitter and never learn anything useful for themselves. 47. Be grateful. Be grateful for not having everything you want. Because if you did, what would there be to look forward to? Be grateful for the things you don't know yet. Because if you knew everything, what would there be left to learn? Be grateful for the tough times. Because without them, would you really grow? Be grateful for your weaknesses, because without them, would you have any reason to improve? Be grateful for the challenges. Because without challenges, what would make you stronger and build your character? Be grateful for the mistakes you've made. Because if you had made none, what would teach you valuable lessons? Be grateful for times when you are tired. Because if you were never tired, does that mean you are not working hard enough? It's easy to be thankful for the good things, but life always offers new opportunities to appreciate even the imperfections. Always remember that thinking positively can turn negatives into positives. If you learn to appreciate your troubles, they can truly become beneficial. When speaking to someone who is down, avoid showing off your success as it can add to their sorrow. Therefore, even if everything is going your way, try to be considerate of the hardships of others. When speaking to someone who is boastful, avoid talking about your own difficulties, as they might not empathize with your struggles. So, even when things are not going your way, try to keep your spirits up. Friends made in hard times might leave when times are good, feeling that your improved life means you're no longer on their level. They might seek higher status connections and may feel insecure if your thoughtless words or actions make them feel inferior. Errors made with friends during good times can be hard to mend during bad times, as they might feel you've lost your former glory, not because you've become more humble, but because you have no other choice but to rebuild old friendships. If you once rejected them, they might now reject you. 48. The Pain Reliever Pill In the pages of our school autograph books, there's a simple question that's not so easy to answer. What makes you cry? Among the hundreds of confessions I've read, like when I'm sad, when I fail, when I get spanked, one unusual admission stood out. I cry when I realize that I've made my loved ones cry. In our childhood, Boys often found joy in girls' tears. Tripping a girl on the doorstep so she'd fall face first, pulling her hair painfully, or hiding her cherished colored pencil set under a table, all these would make her cry louder, and the more she cried, the more the boys enjoyed it. The one who made others cry the most was seen as strong and brave. As we got a little older, we realized it's not cool to make others sad, However, sometimes we make others cry without even meaning to, rushing to school and splashing through a puddle, inadvertently dirtying a girl's brand new white dress as she passes by, staring at a person with disabilities, laughing quietly, gossiping excitedly about someone with a friend. It's such unintentional acts that can cause silent tears to fall, tears that neither you nor I can see. And then, as we grow up further, we begin to learn how to hurt others intentionally, but in more subtle ways than tripping or hair-pulling. Out of anger, I might mock a less fortunate classmate with a cruel remark. During a moment of frustration due to a difficult home life, you might unleash a tirade of complaints against your parents. Once we calm down, we might quickly forget what we said, 
but the emotional wounds we caused with our harsh words can take a long time to heal. Did you know that October 17th is the World Day for Overcoming Pain? Across the globe, doctors and hospitals are finding new treatments and surgeries to reduce patient suffering and speed up recovery. In many labs, pharmacists and chemists aim to discover the most effective pain relief drugs for humans. While medicine increasingly effectively treats physical pain, how will we heal the invisible, lingering pain caused by our own carelessness or cruelty? I cry when I realize I've made my loved ones cry. I cry because I realize I've been cruel and careless, crying so I don't repeat my mistakes, crying so that our hearts can turn into pain-relieving pills when we move beyond the indifferent beats that have become too familiar. Opuam. 49. The power of a smile. Smile at each other. Smile at your wife. Smile at your husband. Smile at your children. Smile at everyone. It doesn't matter who it is, and that will help you grow in love for one another. I write this from my own experience. One day, tired after a long day at work, I was heading home with a heavy heart. Then a stranger on the subway smiled at me, and instinctively, I smiled back. Suddenly, all my fatigue seemed to vanish. I once read a story by Saint Exupéry, the author well known for The Little Prince and a pilot who fought against fascism in World War II. He wrote a piece called The Smile during these tumultuous times. I'm not sure if it's a memoir or a work of fiction, but I believe it's true. In the story, Saint Exupéry is a prisoner treated harshly, thinking he might be executed like others. He writes, I was desperate. My hands trembling, I pulled out a cigarette but had no matches. Through the bars, I saw a guard. He didn't see me, so I called out, Excuse me, do you have a light? He shrugged and came closer. As he pulled out a match, our eyes met and I smiled without knowing why perhaps because it's easier to connect with someone with a smile. It seemed like a spark ignited between our souls, between our human hearts. I knew he didn't want to, but because I smiled, he had to smile back. He struck the match, stepped closer, looking into my eyes, still smiling. Suddenly, he was not a fascist jailer in front of me, but just another human being. Do you have children? he asked. Yes, I replied, and pulled out my wallet with my family's picture. Then he too pulled out a photo of his children and began to share his hopes for them. Tears blurred my eyes. I knew I was about to die and would never see my family again. He too cried. Suddenly, without a word, he unlocked my cell and quietly led me out of the city, letting me go before returning alone. Thus, my life was saved by a smile. From this story, I've learned a lot. I know that beneath all the facades we build to protect ourselves and our dignity, there lies something truly precious I call the soul. I believe that if your soul and mine recognize each other, there's nothing left to fear or hate. If you've ever connected with someone through the power of a smile, then you'll agree with me that it is a small miracle, a wonderful gift we can give each other. Mother Teresa felt this in her life and offered heartfelt advice. Smile at each other. Smile at your wife, at your husband, at your children, and at everyone, no matter who it is, because it will help you grow in love for each other. 50. Life is everything. Some dreams will always remain just dreams no matter how hard we try, but they make us stronger help us love life more, and encourage us to keep pushing every day. Some promises will remain just promises, even if we wait forever because the person who made them might forget, but they teach us to hope and look forward. Some plans will remain just plans if someone leaves one day, but they give us moments that are truly wonderful. Some pains will always be there if we can't escape them, but they help us grow. Some mistakes will always be mistakes, and it hurts when we realize we were wrong. But they shock us into recognizing our only real mistake is denying what our heart truly feels.
Sometimes we meet people by chance, maybe just recognize faces or not even notice at all. But those moments can make us realize meeting someone three times might be fate. Some people may just be acquaintances, but they help us realize that a true friend is incredibly special. There might be one person who is just one person to the world but means the world to someone, and because of them, we experience love. Some searches are just simple searches, but they help us understand that in a sea of people, we can still find each other. And there are those who make everything happen because they have dreams. They believe in promises. They hold on to plans. They grow from pain. They learn from their mistakes. They have a true friend, and with them, they have love. Life is everything. 51. The Apple Tree Story Once upon a time, there was a big apple tree. A little boy loved to play around the tree every day. He climbed to the top to pick apples and took naps in its shade. He loved the apple tree, and the tree loved him too. As time went by, the boy grew up and stopped visiting the tree every day. One day, the boy returned looking sad, and the apple tree said excitedly, Come and play with me. I'm not a kid anymore. I don't enjoy playing around trees. I like toys now, and I need money to buy them. I'm sorry I don't have money, but you can pick all my apples and sell them. Then you'll have the money you need. The boy was thrilled. He picked all the apples and happily went away. The apple tree felt sad again because the boy did not come back. Years later, the boy, now a young man, returned, and the apple tree was very happy. Come and play with me. I don't have time to play. I have to work to support my family. My family needs a house to live in. Can you help me? I'm sorry. I don't have a house. But you can cut off my branches to build your house. The young man cut down the branches. The apple tree was happy, but the boy never returned. The tree felt lonely and sad. On a hot summer day, the young man, now older, came back, and the apple tree was overjoyed. Come and play with me. I'm sad because I feel old. I want to go boating alone to relax. Can you give me a boat? Use my trunk to make a boat. Then you can row far away and feel peaceful. The man cut the tree's trunk to make a boat and rowed away. Years later, the man returned. I'm sorry, my boy. I have nothing left to give you. No more apples. I don't have teeth to eat them anymore. I don't have branches for you to climb. I'm too old for climbing. I really can't help you anymore. The only thing left is my dying roots, the apple tree said in tears. I don't need much, just a place to sit and rest. I'm too tired after all these years. Oh, then, this old stump is a good place for you to lean on and rest. Come here with me. The man sat down and the apple tree was happy, shedding tears. This is the story of us all. The apple tree represents our parents. When we're young, we enjoy playing with our parents. As we grow up, we leave them and only come back when we need help. No matter what, our parents are always ready to support us to be happy. We must live in a way that honors our parents. 52. The Sun in the Cold Night A beautiful new lighthouse was just built on the southernmost coast. Its job during the six long, cold winter months is to guide hundreds of ships carrying scientists, tourists, and local inhabitants of this icy continent to safe harbors. It's worth noting that Antarctica only experiences two seasons, winter and summer, each lasting six months. During the winter, the continent is plunged into darkness for six continuous months, and the opposite occurs in the summer. The lighthouse was completed in the middle of summer, and there were still about three months left until winter. Naturally, no one thought to light it up yet, so it wasn't useful. Feeling ignored and unimportant, the lighthouse became very lonely. It rarely spoke to anyone and kept to itself, distancing from everything around it. One day, a breeze passed by and whispered to the lighthouse, Why do you seem so sad? I hate it here. No one cares about me. I should be on a breezy seashore under a sky full of stars. The lighthouse cried out in frustration. Don't be so sad, said the breeze. 
There will come a time when you see your true value. With these encouraging words and a cheerful laugh, the breeze blew away. The lighthouse stood there, sad, gazing into the distance. As summer passed and winter approached, bringing with it dark, cold nights, the lighthouse was finally lit. It shone so brightly over the southern skies that everyone around was amazed. Wow, it's so bright, so wonderful. From now on, finding our way home will be much easier, people exclaimed. Explorers and residents of Antarctica now relied on the lighthouse as a beacon to find and navigate their way. It was then that the lighthouse realized its true worth, just as the breeze had said. It did its best to banish the darkness and light up everything around. The lighthouse felt incredibly proud. Then one day, the breeze returned, swirling around the lighthouse with a playful laugh. Look at me now, said the lighthouse. I really mean something to everyone now. You see, the breeze laughed happily, you've become the sun in the cold night now. And then it drifted away. Feeling overjoyed, the lighthouse followed the breeze and shouted out loud, I am the sun in the cold night. 53. Forever. Forgiving. Lisa sat on the floor with an old box in front of her, containing a piece of paper divided into squares. This is the story behind those squares. How many times should you forgive your siblings? The teacher read aloud, answering for the whole class. Seventy times seven. Lisa tugged at Brent, her younger brother. So how many times is that? Brent wrote the number 490 on the corner of Lisa's notebook. Small and slight with short arms, oversized glasses, and messy hair, Brent was a musical prodigy. He started playing piano at four, the clarinet at seven, and was now mastering the organ. Lisa was only better than him at one thing, basketball, which they played after school. Though Brent was small and not very athletic, he never refused because it was Lisa's only joy amidst her mostly poor grades. After school, they headed to the basketball court. During a play, Lisa accidentally elbowed Brent in the chin. She scored easily and was thrilled until she saw Brent holding his chin. Are you okay? It was an accident. It's fine. I forgive you, he smiled. 490 times to forgive, and this is one, so 489 more to go. Lisa laughed. If she really kept track, she'd have reached 490 a long time ago. The next day, they played Battleship on paper. Afraid of losing, Lisa peeked at Brent's sheet and won easily. You cheated. Brent accused. Lisa blushed. I'm sorry. It's okay. I forgive you, Brent chuckled softly. So that's just 488 more times, right? Moved by Brent's generosity, that night Lisa drew a chart with 490 squares. We'll use this to track my mistakes and your forgiveness. Each time, I'll cross out a square, she said marking two squares immediately and sticking the chart on the wall. Lisa had many chances to mark the chart. Whenever she realized her mistakes, she sincerely apologized. For instance, square 211, Lisa hid Brent's English book, and he got a zero. Square 394, Lisa lost Brent's room key. Square 417, Lisa used too much bleach and ruined Brent's shirt. Square 489, Lisa borrowed Brent's bike and crashed it into a tree. Square 490, Lisa broke Brent's favorite melon-shaped cup. That's it, Lisa declared. I won't make any more mistakes with you. Brent just smiled. Sure, sure. But then there was a 490 first time. By then, Brent was a music student, selected to perform at a major New York music festival, a dream come true, but he wasn't home when the organizers called to confirm the schedule. Lisa answered, 2 p.m. on the 10th, thinking she could remember she didn't write it down. When is your performance? Their mom asked. I don't know. They haven't called yet, Brent replied. 
Lisa was silent before stammering. Um, what day is it today? The twelfth, why? Tears streamed down Lisa's face. The performance, 2 p.m., on the 10th, they called last week. Brent sat silently, stunned. So, the performance has already happened? Brent asked. Lisa nodded. He left the room without another word. Lisa went to her room and cried, feeling she had destroyed her brother's dream and disappointed her family. That night, she packed and left home without telling anyone, leaving a note assuring her family not to worry. Lisa moved to Boston and rented an apartment there. Her parents wrote many times, but she didn't respond. I've hurt Brent. I can't ever go back. That was the thinking of a 19-year-old girl. Years later, she ran into a former neighbor, Mrs. Nelson. I'm so sorry about Brent. Lisa was puzzled. What do you mean? Mrs. Nelson quickly realized Lisa didn't know. She explained everything. A speeding car, an emergency room, dedicated doctors. But Brent didn't survive. That afternoon, Lisa returned home. She sat quietly in front of the box. Instead of the old chart full of crosses, there was a new large paper. Dear Lisa, I never wanted to count forgiveness, but you kept counting. If you want to continue, use this new map I made for you. Love, Brent. On the back was a chart like the one Lisa made as a child with many squares, but only the first square was marked, next to it in red pen. 490 first time. Forgive. Forever. 54. Practical and Impractical Long ago, Gujian's second son was imprisoned by the King of Chu for murder. At that time, in Chu, there was a respected and revered prophet named Zhang Sheng. Gujian heard about this, so he wrote a letter and sent 100 silver coins with his youngest son, instructing him, Take this letter and my letter to Zhang Sheng's house to help your brother. Gujian's eldest son heard about this and wanted to take over the task from his brother, claiming it was his right as the elder sibling. Gujian refused but relented when his wife pleaded on behalf of their eldest son. Gujian was annoyed but agreed for the sake of his wife. Thus, Gujian's eldest son took the letters and gold to Zhang Sheng. After receiving them, Zhang Sheng advised the eldest son, Go back home, never return here, and never ask how your brother was freed. The eldest son still wanted to stay to see how Zhang Sheng would handle the situation. He also bribed officials in the Chu court while Zhang Sheng secretly went to the king of Chu and suggested, Your Majesty, there is a bad omen affecting our land. What should we do to eliminate it? Grant mercy. Hearing this, the king of Chu decided to pardon all prisoners in his realm. Gu Jian's eldest son heard this and suspected Zhang Sheng. He returned to Zhang Sheng's house, and as soon as he entered, Zhang Sheng asked, Why haven't you left? Sir, is it true that the king is about to pardon the prisoners? Zhang Sheng, familiar with such worldly ways, told Gu Jian's eldest son, Take your gold and go back home. Relieved that he had not only completed his mission but also kept his wealth, the eldest son quickly took the gold and returned home. Later, Zhang Sheng met with the king of Chu again. Your Majesty, I hear people say that your decree of pardon was because of Gu Jian's son, as Gu Jian is a wealthy ruler. Angered by this, the King of Chu immediately ordered the execution of Gu Jian's second son. On the day of the funeral, Gu Jian's wife and both sons were devastated, but Gu Jian reflected to himself. I'm not surprised. I knew this would happen. The eldest has been with me through hard times from a young age, while the youngest, born only recently, doesn't understand hardship and only knows how to waste money. Oh, the eldest has suffered so much that he became greedy, leading to this trouble. If the youngest had gone, he would not have cared about the money, and we might have been reunited. 55. Listening and the Stone 
A wealthy man was driving fast in his expensive car through the city streets when he saw a child darting out from between parked cars ahead. He slowed down, but as he passed the spot where he thought he'd seen the child, there was nobody there. Suddenly, he heard the sound of a stone hitting the side of his car. He slammed on the brakes and turned back to where the stone had come from. Indeed, there was a child standing among the parked cars. Jumping out without looking around, the man grabbed the child, pushed him against a nearby car, and shouted, What on earth do you think you're doing? His anger boiling over, he continued, This car is brand new. You're going to pay a lot for that stone. Please, sir, I'm so sorry. I didn't know what else to do, the boy pleaded, tears streaming down his face as he pointed towards the sidewalk. It's my brother, he said. His wheelchair rolled off the curb and he fell out. I can't lift him back in by myself. Sobbing, the boy begged, Please help me put him back in the wheelchair. He's hurt and he's too heavy for me. Approaching the fallen child, the man struggled to swallow the lump in his throat. He lifted the child into the wheelchair, pulled out a handkerchief to clean him up, and checked everything carefully, feeling embarrassed. Thank you so much. You are very kind, the child said with a grateful look before pushing his brother away. The man stood watching for a long time, then slowly walked back to his car. The walk seemed longer than ever. Later on, even though he had his car repaired and repainted several times, he kept the dent as a reminder to himself for the rest of his life. Sometimes you don't take the time to listen until a stone is thrown at you. What will you choose, to listen or wait for a stone? 56. Friendship Two friends were walking on a quiet road. During their walk, they got into a heated argument and one friend slapped the other in the face. The one who was slapped felt pain but didn't say a word. Instead, he wrote in the sand. Today, my best friend slapped me in the face. They continued their journey and soon came upon a river where they decided to stop and swim. Unfortunately, one friend started cramping up and almost drowned, but the other friend quickly saved him. After recovering from the scare, he wrote on a rock, Today, my best friend saved my life. The friend who had earlier slapped his buddy was puzzled and asked, why did you write in the sand when I slapped you, but now you write on a rock? With a smile, the other replied, When a friend hurts us, we should write it in the sand where the winds of forgiveness can erase it away. But when something wonderful happens, we must engrave it in stone as a deep memory in our hearts where no wind can ever erase it. We should learn to write both in the sand and on the rock. 57. The Flower Garden In a secluded forest, hidden away behind several high mountain ranges and shrouded in mist, only small animals live in harmony and warmth. In the middle of the forest, there's a wide clearing with a small but beautiful garden filled with various flowers. This garden and the land it sits on belong to Squirrel and Rabbit, who have been close friends since they were very young. As they grew up, their friendship remained strong, and they decided to create this garden together because they both loved flowers. Every morning, Squirrel and Rabbit would go to the garden to take care of it together. In the evenings, after finishing their daily tasks, they would return to the garden. They would sit together, watching the sunset, listening to the night's breath, and inhaling the fragrant scents of the garden's flowers carried by the breeze. During such evenings, they felt a simple, profound happiness, a joy not easily found. However, a small disagreement arose between them, leading to anger. It seemed like a trivial matter that would soon pass, something not worth staying mad over. But the anger lasted. They stopped talking to each other, each nursing their pride and ego. They didn't want to see each other, annoyed and irritated, what was there to talk about? If they happened to run into each other by chance, they acted as if the other didn't exist. Each thought they were not in the wrong, morning after morning, and evening after evening. 
The small garden lay empty without the friends. Why bother going if it means running into each other? The plants and flowers began to wilt and dry up, perhaps from neglect or perhaps for some other reason. Perhaps the little garden also felt sad for the missing laughter and companionship of squirrel and rabbit. It missed them sitting together, leaning on each other. Maybe I don't need to continue writing. If the garden represents their friendship, if squirrel and rabbit neglect it and avoid each other, what if instead they put aside their pride and made up? If they visited the garden every day, you might choose this ending. But not everything can be perfect. A break once mended teaches us to value it more. However, do we sometimes completely forget to mend it? 58. It's never too late. On my first day of chemistry class, after the professor introduced himself, he challenged us to spot something unusual in the room. As I stood up and looked around, I felt a gentle hand on my shoulder. Turning around, I saw a small, wrinkly old woman smiling brightly at me. She said, Hello, young man. My name is Rose. I'm 87 years old. May I shake your hand? I laughed heartily and replied, Of course, and she gave me a firm handshake. Why are you going to school at such a tender age? I joked. She quipped back, I'm here to find a wealthy husband, get married, have a few kids, then retire and travel. Oh, you're funny. I was really curious to know what had driven her to take on this challenge at her age. I've always dreamed of going to college, and now here I am, she said. After class, we went to the student lounge for some hot chocolate. We became friends instantly, and just three months later, we were inseparable, chatting nonstop on our way home. I always enjoyed listening to this time machine as she shared her life experiences and profound philosophies. That year, Rose became an icon at our school. She made friends everywhere she went and always dressed nicely. At the end of the semester, we invited Rose to speak at a team party, and I will never forget what she told us. She stepped up to the podium, smiled, and said, We should never stop moving. There are four secrets to staying young, happy, and successful. Find something funny to laugh about every day. Have a dream for yourself. When you stop dreaming, you die. There are many people around us who are walking dead because they don't dream. There's a big difference between getting old and growing up. If you spend a year in bed and don't do anything productive, you will grow old into your 20s. Everyone gets old. But you don't have to grow old, you just grow up if you find opportunities and change. And finally, no regrets. Us older folks often don't regret what we've done, but what we haven't done. Only those who have regrets fear death. She concluded by singing La Vie en Rose to us and challenged us to learn the lyrics and live by them. Then, a week before graduation, Rose passed away peacefully in her sleep. Over 2,000 students attended her funeral, mourning a classmate who taught us it's never too late to pursue your dreams. 59. When someone sends out a smile, a girl smiles at a gloomy stranger, and her smile lifts his spirits. He remembers a kind deed from an old friend and writes them a thank you letter. This friend, overjoyed to hear from an old buddy, leaves a big tip for the waitress after lunch. Surprised by the generous tip, the waitress decides to buy a lottery ticket with all of it and wins. The next day, she claims her prize and gives some spare change to a homeless man on the street. Grateful, since he hadn't eaten in two days, the homeless man returns to his dark room after dinner. On his way, he finds a shivering puppy and takes it home to warm up. The puppy is thrilled to be saved from the approaching snowstorm. That night, while everyone is asleep, the house catches fire, but the puppy barks loudly. It barks until it wakes everyone up, saving them all. One of the children saved that night grows up to be a doctor who discovers a vaccine for a deadly disease. All this happened because of a single smile. 60. The Cracked Pot 
A person had two large pots for carrying water. One of the pots had a crack, so when carrying water from the well, it would only be half full by the time they got home. The intact pot was very proud of its perfection, while the cracked pot always felt bad because it couldn't do its job properly. One day, the cracked pot spoke to its owner. I'm so ashamed of myself. I want to apologize to you. Why are you ashamed? Because of my flaw, you don't get all the water you deserve for your hard work. Don't worry. Next time, notice the flower beds along the path as we return home. Indeed, along the roadside, there were vibrant flower beds. The cracked pot felt happy for a moment, but still, when they arrived home, it was only half full of water. I'm sorry, it said again. Did you notice that flowers only grow on your side of the path? I knew about your crack and used it to my advantage. I planted flower seeds on your side of the road, and over the years you've watered them. I picked those flowers to decorate our home. Without you, our home wouldn't be warm and charming like it is. Each of us is like that cracked pot, not perfect. What matters is how we use our flaws to make life more beautiful the people around us. 61. Who has truly changed your life? Try answering these questions. Name the five richest people in the world. Name some recent Miss Universe winners. List 10 Nobel Prize winners. Name six artists who recently received an Academy Award. Is it easy to answer? Probably not. The thing is, none of us remember yesterday's stars even though their achievements are significant. They are superstars in their fields. Yet, when the applause fades, the awards lose their shine and their accomplishments are forgotten. The accolades and titles also disappear along with their owners. Here are some different questions. Let's see how you answer these. Name a few teachers who helped you during your education. List three people who have helped you through tough times. Name some individuals who have taught you valuable lessons. Think of someone who has made you see the value and meaning of life. Think of five people you enjoy talking to. Name a character from a movie whose story you admire and feel moved by. Is that easier? The lesson here is that the people who have truly made a difference in your life are not necessarily the most famous, wealthiest, or most awarded. They are the ones who have truly cared about you. 62. The Worry Tree A Carpenter's Simple Solution to Keeping Work Stress Away from Home The carpenter I hired to help fix up my old house had a rough first day at work, ending it pretty frustrated and annoyed. He struggled for hours with the roof tiles, then dealt with a saw that stopped working and an old truck. When I drove him home, he was silent the whole way, not really in the mood for talking or laughing. At his place, he invited me to meet his family. As we approached the front door, he suddenly stopped next to a small tree and gently touched its top with both hands. When the door opened, it was like he was a completely different person. His sun-darkened face brightened with a smile. He hugged his two little kids tightly and tenderly kissed his wife. After some time chatting, he drove me back home. Passing by the small tree near the door, my curiosity got the better of me, and I asked about his earlier action. Oh, that's my worry tree, he replied cheerfully. I know I can't avoid problems at work, and I definitely shouldn't bring them home to bother my wife and kids who've been waiting for me all day. So every evening when I come home, I leave all my troubles and frustrations on that tree, then, in the morning when I leave for work, I pick them up again. But you know what's funny, the carpenter continued. When I go out in the morning to pick them up, there always seems to be less worry than what I left the night before. 63. Cherishing every moment. Embracing love and forgiveness in the face of uncertainty. If I knew it was the last time I would see you sleeping peacefully, I would hold you tight and pray to God to protect your soul. If I knew it was the last time I would see you walk out the door, I would hug you tightly, 
kiss you loudly and ask you to come back. If I knew it was the last time I would hear your name being praised, I would record every word, every action, and watch those videos over and over again. If I knew it was the last time to spare a minute or two, I would stop and say, I love you so much, even though you might already know that. Tomorrow might bring forgetfulness, that's for sure, and we won't get a second chance to do everything right. There are many ways to express love and plenty of opportunities to show we can do it all. Just in case I'm confused, and today is all I have, I would tell you how much I love and cherish you. I hope I never forget that tomorrow isn't promised to anyone, and today could be the last chance to hold the ones you love close to your heart. If you're waiting for tomorrow, why not do everything today? Because if tomorrow never comes, you will deeply regret not having spent those last few moments sharing a smile, a hug, or a kiss, and that you were too busy to give someone what could have made their dream come true. Keep the ones you truly love close to you, whisper in their ear, tell them how much you love them, and that you will always cherish their dear image. Take the time to say, I'm sorry, please forgive me, thank you, or it's okay, everything will be fine. And if tomorrow never comes, you won't regret today once you've said these words. Learn to apologize, start over, and tell your loved ones how much you love them too. 64. Friendship lasts forever. At some point in your life, you find a close friend. This person can change your life, even in the smallest way. They can make you laugh so hard that you can't stop. They make you believe that the world is truly a beautiful place. They spend hours convincing you that the door to life hasn't closed on you, and it's opening right now. That's your friend forever. When you're down and the world around you seems too dark and empty, this friend lifts you up and makes the darkness and emptiness suddenly bright and full. This friend can guide you through life's tough moments when you're sad or confused, they will take your hand and tell you that everything will be all right. And if you have found such a friend, you feel happy and complete because you don't need to worry. You have a friendship that will never end. Thinking of you, I want to say that your thoughts brighten my loneliest days. Somehow you're always there with a smile and cheer ready to share. You make me smile when I'm most down. You are the best friend I've ever had. Thank you for being my friend. 65. Two Bricks When arriving in a new land, monks had to build everything themselves. They purchased land, bricks, tools, and got to work. One young novice was assigned to build a brick wall. He focused intently on his task, always checking to ensure each brick was perfectly aligned. His work progressed slowly because he was so meticulous. However, he wasn't bothered by this, knowing he was about to build his first ever beautiful wall. Finally, he completed the job as the sun set. As he stepped back to admire his work, something caught his eye. Despite his careful attention, two bricks in the middle of the wall were crooked. They stood out like glaring eyes staring at him. From that day on, whenever visitors came to the temple, the novice guided them everywhere except near the wall he built. One day, two elder monks visited the temple. The novice tried to steer them away, but they insisted on seeing the area where he built the wall. Standing before it, one monk exclaimed, Oh, what a beautiful brick wall! Are you serious? Don't you see those two ugly bricks right in the middle? The novice asked in surprise. Yes, but I also see the 998 other bricks that have come together to form a wonderful wall, the elder monk replied calmly. 66. I love. I've started to love life all over again, not in a new way, but in an old, familiar way. When I realized I was losing some of my good habits, I was startled. Rekindling an old habit isn't hard. I love the early mornings when the sun hasn't risen high yet and the first rays haven't touched anyone's face, filling the space with shades of gray. The air feels different at times, sometimes cool, sometimes chilling, 
but always soothing and refreshing. It makes for a beautiful morning. I love the windy days, the worries, the troubles, and the thoughts. They all seem to blow away with the wind. It's a strangely comforting feeling. I love all the branches, blades of grass, and flowers on my way home. Each day they change, becoming more beautiful, intriguing, and captivating. I enjoy walking slowly home on this long path, allowing me to appreciate the beauty around me and recognize my happiness. I love the corner of the cafe where I sit alone, slowly savoring my solitude, observing life around me and thinking at my own pace. I love my beach, oddly. My love for it grows thicker each day. Perhaps the beach holds too many of my memories and worries. My emotions are drawn to the sea, my loves, my moments of solitude, my friends. How can I fully express what I feel each time I sit watching the sea or when I walk on its sandy shores, tightly packed with silt? How did I come to love the sea so much? I love the moments that sting, the times I've sobbed because I stumbled, and I know I'm still so small with much more to strive for. I love the poems I write, even though they're not great, but they satisfy my love for rhyming and expressing feelings. I enjoy reading poetry and am easily moved by it, even though I'm not very good at literature. I could never list everything I love because life has too many things that catch my attention and hold my affection. When I still love, it means I'm not superficial, not indifferent, and not dull. I believe that. Speaking of the things I love shows how interesting life can be. 67. Unanswered Letters There was a man who suffered a terrible traffic accident that left him without both legs and his left arm. Even his right hand only had a thumb and forefinger left. Despite these challenges, he still had a sharp mind and a kind heart. During his long stay in the hospital, he felt very lonely because he had no family or friends to visit him. There were no phone calls, no letters. It was as if he was cut off from the world. Overcoming his disappointment, he had an idea. If he longed so much to receive a letter, and a letter could bring so much joy, why not write letters to bring joy to others? Despite the difficulty, he could still write using the two fingers on his right hand. But who to write to? Who out there was longing for a letter, and who could be uplifted by his words? He thought of prisoners. They were lonely and needed support, too. He first wrote to a social organization, asking them to deliver his letters to the inmates. They replied that his letters would not be answered because state laws prohibited prisoners from sending letters outside. But he decided to go ahead with this one-way communication anyway. He wrote two letters every week. It was physically demanding, but he poured his soul into those letters, sharing his life experiences, his beliefs, and his hopes. Many times he wanted to stop, never knowing if his letters were of any use to anyone. But writing had become a habit, so he continued. Then one day, he finally received a letter. It was written on prison paper by the warden himself. The letter was very brief just a few lines, saying, Please write on the best quality paper you can find. Your letters are passed from one cell to another and from one prisoner to another to the point that the paper is worn out. Thank you. 68. Speaking from the Heart As I was walking to the coffee shop, my mind cluttered with thoughts about the work I had just finished at the office and the class I teach in the afternoon. I suddenly felt a light tap on my arm. I stopped. There was no one around. I continued walking, only to feel another tap. This time, I turned around completely and looked down. There stood a little boy. His eyes were pale, perhaps accentuated by his dirty cheeks and tangled black hair. He couldn't have been older than six. His face was dirty. He was barefoot, wearing torn clothes, and his hair was a mess. He looked much like the hundreds of thousands, if not more, of orphaned children who roamed the streets of Rio de Janeiro. Bread, sir? 
In Brazil, we often have the chance to buy a candy bar or a piece of bread for these homeless and orphaned children. I told him to follow me and we went into a snack shop together. Coffee for me and something to eat for this little guy? I asked. The boy ran to the counter and chose his food. Normally, these street kids grab the food and leave immediately, returning to the streets without saying a word. But this boy surprised me. The snack counter was quite long, with coffee placed at one end and a sandwich at the other. Usually, people know that the street kids who get a sandwich bought for them will leave right away, and they don't really want them hanging around because they look ragged and dirty. I started drinking my coffee and, when I finished, paid for it and looked outside only to realize he was standing there, as he couldn't stay inside for long, on tiptoes, holding the sandwich, peering through the glass door, watching. What is he doing? I thought. I went outside, he saw me and quickly ran up to me. The orphaned Brazilian boy stood before me, only reaching up to my waist. He looked up at me, a tall American stranger, and smiled, a smile that could make your heart stop for a second, and said, Thank you, sir. Then, a bit anxiously, he scratched his foot, stood on his toes, and shouted, Thank you so much, sir. If I could, I would have bought the whole shop for him. Before I could say anything, he turned and ran away. As I write this, I'm still sitting outside the snack shop where I bought the sandwich for the boy. I'm late for my class. But I'm still moved and thinking about the boy. And I wonder, if a simple thank you from a street boy for a sandwich can move me so much, how touched would we be if we all said thank you, truly thankful for what others do for us? Take the time to say thanks and never hold back on giving thanks. 69. A letter from mom to her blogger child. Dear sweetheart, mom feels like you're growing further away each day. Our time together has been getting less frequent. You've grown up past those long school days when you'd come home for a quick dinner before hitting the books again. Mom thought we would share more family meals together. But now... When you come home from work, you're always glued to the computer. Mom reassures herself, thinking you must be busy with work. Mom walks by, clearing her throat. You don't notice because you're busy blogging about your plans getting approved by your boss. Dad wears the new shirt Mom bought. Everyone compliments it, but you're just busy commenting on someone else's blog theme. Your sibling brags about their school grades and you're just happily commenting on someone else's post. Honey, why is it like this? Mom feels like she and the family barely exist in your eyes. You don't know Dad has been having back pain. You don't know how tired Mom is today. You don't know. Yet, you immediately know when a blogger is upset over a breakup or another is thrilled about a new blog theme or when someone posts an interesting entry my dear, are these virtual things more important than your family? Mom wants to understand you. So now she blogs too. Mom's blog might be simple, but she had to start it to add you. She reads to find out how you are today. What happened in your day? Are you happy or sad? What's new with you? Mom learns things you don't talk about. Honey, Mom is sad. Today, Mom talked to you. You said... It's easier to talk and share feelings on the blog. It's easier to trust because no one knows each other. Oh, my dear, Mom is so worried. Are these soulless words that important to you? Will tomorrow, my dear, no longer need hand-holding, kisses, or meeting up? Just chats, just emojis to express feelings. Will your future family be silent? Just the click-clack of the keyboard? Just staring at the computer screen? Honey, Mom hopes you find balance. Life is real. 70. Is that glass of water heavy? The show host lifted a glass of water high and asked the audience, Do you think this glass of water is heavy? The answer was, It depends on how long you hold it. Exactly, if I hold it for just a minute, it's no big deal. But if I hold it for an hour, my arm will start to ache. And if I hold it for a whole day, you'd have to call an ambulance for me. The weight is the same, but 
The longer I carry it, the heavier it feels. Life is similar. If we keep holding on to our burdens all the time, they will start to feel heavier as time goes on. Eventually, we'll break down. What we need to do is put the glass down for a while before holding it again. Sometimes, we need to put down the burdens of life, take a rest to gather strength and then continue carrying them. When you get home, leave your work worries at the door. Tomorrow, you can pick them up again and carry on. 71. Mom is always there for you. Ron, a 15-year-old sophomore at Granger High School, was thrilled about his first soccer game. Eagerly, he invited his mom to come watch. She promised to be there with a few friends. After the game, she waited outside the locker room to take Ron home. How did you like the game, Mom? Did you see the three passes our team made through the opponent's solid defense? Did you notice how we regained our composure after the initial confusion in the first half? Ron asked. His mom replied, Ron, you were awesome. You were there, and I'm so proud of how confidently you looked. You pulled up your socks 11 times during the game. You were sweating profusely, drank water eight times, and splashed water on your face twice. I really liked how you patted players number 19 and 5 on the back when they came off the field. Mom, how do you know all that? Why do you think I was awesome? I didn't even get to play in the game, Ron was surprised. His mom laughed, hugged him tightly, and said, Ron, I don't know much about soccer. I didn't come here to watch the game. I came to watch you, my dear. Keep pushing forward. You'll get your chance. 72. Loving someone. Loving someone means you cherish the gifts they give you, no matter how small. Loving someone is realizing they aren't just yours but belong to the whole world too, and still, they mean so much to you. Loving someone is being your true self when you're with them. Loving someone is waking up every morning feeling happy because you have another day to love and be loved. Loving someone is realizing they are a gift from life itself, wanting to walk beside you for your whole life. They will share your days and nights, from sleep to life's worries. They will discover secrets in you that only the two of you know, and no matter where you hide, they will find you and give you the strongest, safest place to lean on with all their love. Loving someone is noticing that each day they bring you something new. They will smile at you genuinely, speak with a sweet voice, look at you with affection and care for you with loving gestures. With them by your side, the ordinary becomes extraordinary. They will open doors with you to a future filled with happiness. Have you ever loved someone like that? 73. Letter to my son. Dear son, we had an argument and both of us were really upset. I lost my temper and we ended up raising our voices. You know, in the end, yelling doesn't solve anything. It just makes everything worse. I was so glad when you came to apologize last night. I know it wasn't easy, especially when we each think we're right. I'm sorry, too. I was wrong to lose my cool. It's easy to make a mistake, but much harder to correct it. It was tough for me to say, sorry, son, but I'm relieved I did. You might not realize, but when you get angry, I feel like I've lost all control. It scares me. I can't manage my emotions anymore, and I have to either fight or flee. I chose to fight this time. Apologizing is tough. It goes against our natural pride. Everyone wants to be right, and saying sorry means admitting you're wrong. It requires a shift in mindset, accepting your mistakes, and humbling yourself. However, there's a downside to apologizing because if the same situation happens again, the apology might seem worthless. But I believe apologizing is the right thing to do. We need to learn from this and figure out how to act better in the future. So we should let go of each other's past mistakes. We can't carry these burdens through life. I'm so happy, son, that you apologized and gave me a chance to say sorry. We gave each other a chance to forgive and to remember just how much we love each other. Love, Dad. P.S.
This is a letter from a father to a son after an argument. Parents might not always express themselves this way, but believe that they always have a letter like this in their hearts. Whenever you're feeling down or hurt by angry words from your parents, read this letter to soothe your heart and remember how much your parents love you. 74. We are the dumb ones. On my first day teaching, everything went smoothly until the last period. When I walked into the classroom, I heard the sound of breaking furniture. In one corner, I saw one student pinning another to the floor. Listen, you idiot, the one on the bottom yelled. I don't care about your sister. Don't you touch her, you hear? The one on top threatened. I asked them to stop fighting. Suddenly, all 14 pairs of eyes were on me. I knew I didn't look very convincing. Both students glared at each other and at me, then slowly returned to their seats. That's when a teacher from the next room popped his head in, shouted at my students to sit down, be quiet, and listen to me. I felt powerless. I tried to teach the lesson I had prepared, but was met with suspicious, grim faces. After class, I held back the student who had started the fight. His name was Mark. Ma'am, don't waste your time on us, he said. We are just dumb. And Mark left the room. Stunned, I collapsed into a chair and wondered if I should really be a teacher. Maybe it was best to give up? I told myself to try for one year and then do something more useful after I got married next summer. Did they give you trouble? The teacher from earlier asked. I nodded. Don't worry about it, he said. I teach them in summer school and they're likely not going to graduate. Don't waste your time on them. What do you mean? They live in makeshift homes. They're day laborers. They only come to school when they feel like it. The other kid harassed Mark's sister while they were picking beans together. I had to scold them at lunch. Just keep them quiet and busy. Call me if they cause any trouble. As I packed up to leave, I couldn't forget Mark's words and his face when he said, We are just dumb. The word echoed in my head. I decided I had to do something significant. The next afternoon, I told my colleague not to enter my classroom anymore. I needed to handle these kids my way. I returned to class and looked each student in the eye. Then I went to the board and wrote, Exinage. That's my name, I said. Can anyone tell me what it is? The kids said it was a weird name and they had never seen one like it. I then wrote Janice on the board. The kids gasped and looked at me excitedly. You're right. My name is Janice, I said. I have dyslexia, which means I have trouble reading. When I started school, I couldn't write my name correctly. I couldn't read letters and numbers just floated away from me. I was nicknamed the dumb one. Yes, I used to be dumb. I still remember those horrible sounds and the shame I felt. How did you become a teacher? A child asked. Because I hated those nicknames and I'm not stupid and I love to learn. It's the same for our class. If you like being called dumb, you don't need to be here. Transfer to another class. No one is dumb here. I won't go easy on you, I continued. We will work hard until you understand. You will graduate, and I hope some of you will go to college. It's not a joke. It's a promise. I don't want to hear dumb ever again. Do you understand? The kids seemed more serious. We worked hard, and I started to fulfill my promise. Mark was particularly bright. I overheard him say to another kid, This book is great. We don't read kids' books here. He was holding to kill a mockingbird. Time passed, and their progress was wonderful. One day Mark told me, People still think we're dumb because we mess up our grammar. That was the moment I'd been waiting for. From then on, we intensely studied grammar because the kids wanted to. I was sad to see June approaching, as the kids wanted to learn so much. They all knew I was getting married and moving away. I could see the kids were emotional whenever I mentioned it. I was glad they loved me, but afraid they'd be upset when I left. On the last day of the school year, as I arrived at school, the principal called me as soon as I entered the gate. Please come with me, he said sternly. There's something in your classroom. 
He led the way to my classroom. What was it? I was nervous. Amazingly, the kids had spray-painted flowers on every wall, placed bouquets on each desk and a large bouquet on my desk. How? Did the kids manage that, I wondered. Most of them were so poor that they needed school aid for warm clothes and food. I cried, and the kids cried with me. Later, I learned how they had managed it. Mark, who worked part-time at a flower shop on weekends, had seen many orders from other classes. He told his friends about it. Too proud to be seen as poor, Mark asked the shop owner for leftover flowers. Then he went to the cemetery and told about a teacher who was moving away. People saved flower baskets for him. It wasn't the last thing the kids did for me. Two years later, all 14 students graduated and six got college scholarships. 28 years later, I was teaching at a prestigious school not far from the old one. I learned Mark had married his college sweetheart and become a successful businessman. And surprisingly, three years ago, Mark's son was in my class. Sometimes I laugh when I remember my first day of teaching, thinking about how I wanted to quit to do something better. 75. Love Passionately This is a letter from a father to his daughter before he leaves this life for eternity. My dear child, even if you are afraid of love, it will find you. If it brings joy, cherish it as a mother cherishes her newborn. If it causes pain, it may still touch your soul. Never question if the person you love is deserving of you. Love that is bargained for, like a market commodity, is no longer love. When you love, do so without hesitation or calculation. If your beloved is poor, then work together to build and beautify your love. If your beloved is older, help them feel young again with you. If your loved one is disabled, be their steadfast support. The most beautiful love will come to you if you follow what I've taught you. Always be cautious and see why someone loves you. If they love you for your beauty, remember, your beauty will fade. If they love you for your status, confirm that they don't truly love you. Tell them, status never brings happiness to people. Only genuine self-sufficiency satisfies a true heart. You must be forgiving if they truly repent. Remain loyal to your beloved and build a life together. If you lose these precious qualities, you will feel shame and have no right to pride in yourself or in society. If you allow someone else to place a deceitful, dirty kiss on your lips, they will despise you before the kiss and even more so after. Who will care for your life, rejoice at good news, and grieve at misfortune? That should be your spouse. Go ahead and love, love passionately as your mother once loved me. 76. There's still hope. During that winter, I stayed in Castelmere, a village near Livorno, Italy, which was almost completely devastated. Every morning, I would encounter Maria Bendetti, a small, frail, elderly woman. She walked barefoot, wearing a faded black dress with hints of dark red, and her head was wrapped in a worn black scarf. She carried a wicker basket on her bent back. Maria's face was wrinkled, dark and gaunt, showing signs of hardship and despair. She sold fish, the odd and unappetizing types from the Mediterranean, which the villagers relied on along with some pasta to survive. I remember the village in peaceful times, filled with happy, carefree people. Now, the small construction site was just rubble from bombings, devoid of the laughter and music that once filled the air. The area smelled faintly of plum blossoms, making the desolate scene feel like a graveyard, and it saddened me. The place that used to be so lively was now completely destroyed, a site of utter desolation. Most of the young people had left for other places. However, the elderly and children remained. They moved like ghosts among the ruins with just a few boats and patched up nets, struggling to make ends meet. Among those who stayed was Maria. Sometimes she was accompanied by her 10-year-old granddaughter. 
Thin and ragged, the girl walked barefoot beside Maria, calling out, Fish for sale! Fresh fish! As if to convince passers-by that the fish were just caught. Observing them, I felt deeply sad and worried. They seemed to cling to a past that was long gone. One morning, as they passed the devastated site, I spoke with them. They had survived bombings during the war and now lived in a basement in Eustatia Alley, the poorest part of the village. Moved by compassion, I pessimistically asked Maria, Why don't you move somewhere else? Is there any future left here? It's all destroyed. Maria paused and then slowly shook her head, saying, This is our home. It's not completely gone. As they walked away, they seemed to exchange a playful wink, agreeing silently. This piqued my curiosity. Several days later, I discreetly followed them, not wanting to seem intrusive. In the mornings, they did their daily chores like everyone else, but in the afternoons, they disappeared. Several times after lunch, I went to Eustatia Alley. Their small room was always empty. Could it be that they weren't as simple as I thought? Were they involved in something secretive, like smuggling or black market dealings? One day, I went to their alley earlier than usual and hid by a gate. Around noon, Maria and her granddaughter emerged from the basement, each carrying an empty basket and cheerfully set off. I followed them like a thief. They navigated through the ruined houses to the edge of the village, where they followed a sun-baked path down to a dry riverbed. From a vantage point above, I was amazed to see many people digging and scooping up soil and stones. Maria and her granddaughter set their baskets down and began to work. At first, I thought they were looking for treasure, but then I saw the girl scoop up sand while the old woman carefully selected flat, white stones. When their baskets were full, they slowly climbed the steep slope back up. As they passed by where I was hiding, I wondered if they saw me. They showed no sign, however. After they passed, I continued to watch. The path led to the highest point in the village, to a small hill that was untouched by destruction. A group from the village was working there among the eucalyptus trees, quietly mixing mortar and fitting the beautiful white stones together to build the walls of a grand structure. At first, I was puzzled. Then I realized their purpose. They were determined to build a new and splendid church, not just a makeshift shelter, but a grand place of worship, more beautiful than any old church in the area. Maria and her granddaughter dumped their load of sand and stones, took a brief rest, and then headed back down to the river. As they passed me, Maria glanced at me with a gentle, secretive smile that seemed to say, So, do you really think our future is completely gone? Her entire life was evident in that look, from the past through the present to the future. A life of courage, patience, and unwavering faith. A determination to accept the inevitable and maintain hope. I felt ashamed as they disappeared down the path. I realized that despite the devastation, if such frail elders and vibrant youths could hold such strong faith, then there was still hope for the world. I stood on the hill for a long time. Eventually, as I descended and felt calmer and uplifted, the evening star appeared, faint yet sparkling against the boundless sky, and the village faded into the mist rising from the sea. But in that spiritually vibrant place, I saw all the fire shining brightly. 77. How Animals Love Each Other a Japanese homeowner, while renovating his house, discovered a lizard stuck in a wall. A nail that had been driven through the outside of the wall had accidentally pierced the lizard's tail. Surprisingly, the homeowner remembered that the nail had been in the wall for ten years, yet somehow the lizard was still alive. He called in a zoo expert to investigate this mystery. They set up a telescope ten meters away from where the lizard was trapped, hoping to uncover the reason behind this miraculous survival. Sure enough, before long, another lizard appeared from within the wall, carrying food in its mouth and feeding the trapped lizard bit by bit. 
All the onlookers were deeply moved. They believed that only love could have such great power. True love, they felt, isn't altered by life or death, allowing one lizard to survive ten years nailed in a wall and another to spend ten years caring for its friend. 78. Don't worry, I am hope. In a quiet room. It was so silent that we could hear the candles talking. There were four candles burning and they were talking to each other. The first candle said, I am the flame symbolizing peace. But at this time, I am so unfortunate. People are always waging war and hating each other, so should I even exist? After saying this, the candle slowly dimmed and then completely went out. The second candle continued, I symbolize love, but ironically, nowadays people almost forget about me. They are jealous and envious of each other. Even siblings in the same family feel this way. I am so tired. After speaking, this candle also flickered out. Then the third candle spoke. I am faith, but who needs me anymore in life now? I have become redundant and luxurious. People now only chase practical things and never believe in themselves anymore. I'm leaving. After saying this, it also slowly extinguished and emitted a puff of white smoke. The room then became dark and cold. Only one last candle was still burning, like a lonely star at the edge of the sky. Suddenly, a boy walked in and said, Why aren't you burning anymore? The world still needs you. Then the fourth candle spoke. Don't worry, I am hope. If I'm still burning, even if the flame is weak, we can still relight peace, love, and faith. The boy's eyes lit up, and he used the fourth candle, the candle of hope, to relight the other extinguished candles. 79. A brushstroke from disaster, a lesson on awareness and perspective. You never know when a huge abyss might be gaping right under your feet. There once was an artist who had long harbored the dream of creating a masterpiece for future generations. One day, he finally got started. To escape the daily noise and bustle, he set up a large 30-square-meter easel on the rooftop of a windy high-rise building. The artist worked tirelessly for half a year, so absorbed in his painting that he forgot to eat and sleep. When finished, his painting would immortalize his name through the ages. One morning, as usual, the artist continued to perfect his brushstrokes to the amazement of dozens of visiting tourists. The presence of the crowd didn't distract him at all. Lost in his passionate obsession, he absent-mindedly admired his creative work, slowly stepping back to get a better view of the painting, unaware that he was moving toward the edge of the rooftop. Among the dozens of mesmerized visitors, only a few noticed the imminent danger. One more step backward and he would plummet hundreds of meters into the void. However, no one dared to speak up, fearing that a warning might startle him into falling. An eerie silence took over. Suddenly, a man approached the easel. He grabbed a paintbrush dipped it into the paint and smeared it across the painting, ruining what had been a perfect masterpiece. Enraged, the artist roared and rushed to the painting, snatching the brush from the man's hand. Still furious, he raised his hand to strike the man, but the surrounding crowd quickly intervened, holding the artist back and explaining the situation. An elderly man with silver hair then came over and gently said, In life, we often get so caught up in painting our future visions. Although these visions may be beautiful and captivating, that very allure can make us oblivious to the dangers close by, even right under our feet. So, if someone ever tarnishes the future you've painstakingly painted, don't rush to anger. First, take a moment to assess your current situation. You might be standing on the brink of an abyss without even realizing it. 80. The Emotions You'll Encounter in Life 
People say that one day all the emotions and traits gathered on earth. After boredom yawned for the third time, sincerity came up with an idea. Let's play hide and seek. After sincerity spoke, enthusiasm and effort immediately agreed. Excitement was thrilled. Hesitation, after some thought, was also convinced to join. Even indifference, who usually shows no interest, decided to play. Truth agreed to participate, but insisted on not hiding anywhere. Pride thought the game was childish and timidity didn't want to take any risks. One, two, three. Sincerity closed his eyes and began to count. Faith soared into the sky, believing nothing is impossible. Victory climbed to the top of the tallest tree, and jealousy hid right behind Victory's shadow. Generosity found a very secretive spot but gave it up for a friend. In contrast, selfishness found a snug and hidden spot and refused to share it. Lying hid in the dark depths of the ocean, passion and desire hid on top of scorching volcanoes. As for forgetful, sorry, I forgot where he hid. One million! Sincerity finished counting and opened his eyes. Near the water, Sincerity immediately found Beauty, who was so absorbed in admiring her reflection in the pond that she was found first. Hesitation, unable to decide which side of the fence to jump down, was found right away. One by one, Sincerity found everyone, skill hiding among fresh grass blades, melancholy in a damp, dark cave, passion and desire on the volcanoes. No need to look for selfishness who was frantically fleeing from a spot he thought was cozy when attacked by a swarm of bees. And of course, no one helped since he initially claimed the hiding spot for himself. And lying was found on a rainbow. Of course, this is a lie because lying was hiding at the bottom of the ocean, remember? But love was nowhere to be found. Sincerity searched behind ancient trees, under rivers, over mountains, but love was always elusive. Just as he was about to give up, Sincerity noticed a rose bush rustling. He picked up a large stick and hit the bush a few times to see if anyone was hiding there. Suddenly, someone screamed in pain. The thorns of the roses had poked into the eyes of love. Full of regret, Sincerity hurriedly apologized and promised from then on he would always be there to guide love. The other friends felt sorry for love and gathered around, saying they would take turns caring for love. From then on, love had many emotional friends, sometimes with one, sometimes with another. But people say that love and sincerity always stick together. 81. How to apologize to others. Saying I'm sorry can be easy to write down on paper. However, when it comes to actually saying it to someone, we often feel a lump in our throat, as the famous singer Elton John once said. Sorry seems to be the hardest word. Apologizing acknowledges that we have done something wrong, whether it's an unintentional remark, a rash action, or an inappropriate gesture. Through an apology, we want to convey the following message. I truly regret and am tormented by what I have done. I hope you can forgive me. This is why apologizing often makes us feel so small, as if apologizing is a sign of weakness, a loss of power, and as if we're giving someone else control over us. However, it's a fact that no one is perfect and no one can claim they are flawless. Therefore, your willingness to admit your mistakes, face them directly, and act to make things right again shows great mental strength and character. Your friends and family, colleagues, parents, etc., will not underestimate your efforts. On the contrary, they will respect you more, be more forgiving, and move past the pain and sorrow. Asterisk when should you apologize? In any situation, it is best to apologize as soon as possible to show your good intentions. If you hesitate or make excuses, 
saying you don't need to apologize because you did nothing wrong or if you only apologize conditionally, you are only complicating the issue. Remember these details to understand the necessity and urgency of an apology. Have you said something that was a bit harsh and saw the pain and surprise on their face? You've hurt your friend significantly. Has anyone ever shouted or spoken harshly to you? You probably didn't like it, and it might have even annoyed you. Yet, you did the same to someone you care about, which is truly regrettable. Some people are more sensitive than others. What you might consider trivial can have a significant impact on their lives. Or, during an argument, everyone tries to win by saying the heaviest words, and you think the other person should apologize to you. The issue here is not whether you intended to hurt or disappoint someone, but that you committed the crime, even if you were innocent. Apologizing early in such cases shows bravery and quick thinking, much better than a belated, regretful attitude when you are backed into a corner. Asterisk, perfecting yourself. Knowing how to apologize is a sign of a healthy life for a person with self-respect and empathy. However, using sorry too frequently can diminish its value. If you apologize but continue to make similar mistakes, others may doubt your sincerity. Let your sorry have a greater and more magical impact when self-improvement shows you care and are committed to improving the relationship positively. Asterisk. How to say sorry. Saying sorry is an important step to fix the mistakes and damage you've caused through your recent actions. However, depending on your sincerity, there are better ways to rebuild trust and positive feelings. Avoid apologizing through email or phone if you can meet in person. Apologize with sincere eye contact, kind gestures, and a calm demeanor. Don't make lengthy excuses. Instead, face the issue directly and take responsibility. Show a gesture of goodwill that's out of the ordinary to create a notable difference in your behavior. If possible, giving flowers with an apology can be very effective. After apologizing, you need to forgive yourself first, as you've acknowledged your mistake and are striving to live better. Learn from this experience to become a new, more positive and wiser person. Otherwise, you'll end up regretting and having to apologize over and over again. 82. Where is happiness? On a beautiful morning, a little puppy ran up to its mother and asked, Mom, where is happiness? The mother puppy smiled and replied, Happiness is in your cute little tail. The puppy loved this idea and spent its days admiring its tail happily wagging it as it jumped around. But then one day, the puppy came to its mother feeling sad. Mom, why can't I ever catch happiness? The mother gently stroked the puppy and answered, Just keep moving forward with confidence and happiness will follow you. 83. How has life been treating you lately? How long has it been since we last asked this? It's great to say it, whether to friends or even to ourselves. When we ask this, it always makes the person pause their work and think about what's been happening recently. It also shows that we care about them. How many friends have you not been in touch with? Are you not contacting them because you don't want to? Or do you think they've forgotten who you are? Does it really matter what others think? As long as you think about them, care for them, and still consider them as friends, that's enough. So, if you're always caring about your friends, shouldn't you also take care of yourself? If you're feeling down, why not make some tea, sit down, and listen to your heart asking, has life been good to you recently? What are you waiting for? Why not call someone you've been thinking about during the holidays or their birthday and say, hey, it's been a long time. How have you been doing lately? Is life treating you well? 84. The mirror. No one knows why it's not there anymore. Every morning when I go to work and step into the elevator, I look at it. It's not for any particular reason, just a daily habit, like how you might fix your hair. 
pace back and forth in the bathroom a few times and look at yourself without knowing why you do it. But for me, in this dull world, the absence of the mirror in the elevator is something significant. It made the cramped elevator feel a bit more spacious. The heavy, senseless metal box seemed to have a soul, and the brief journey from the ground floor to my destination or back down to the lobby less monotonous. In those 30 seconds, which felt like an eternity, you could see yourself in the mirror. You could hide your awkwardness if you didn't like the person riding with you or had nothing to say, or you simply realized that the stories you made up to tell during the ride were just pretenses to pass the time, and you just watched the numbers indicating the floors pass by, wishing they would hurry. If life is a mix of falsehoods and truths, then the elevator mirror perfectly reflects that reality. In just a few brief seconds, people can lie to each other or remain silent just to pass the brief time it takes to reach their desired floor and the mirror witnesses it all. I had a habit of looking into it every day when I entered and exited the elevator. My physical self was there, not losing a bit of flesh or a hair, but the mirror could never capture the soul of me or anyone else. There were times I felt sad, not happy or melancholic, and I didn't want to look into it. When I was happy and relieved, I wanted to capture my smile there. Sometimes when I felt like breaking something, I wanted to look into it too. It seems every movie about heartbreak or broken relationships shows someone throwing something at a mirror, shattering it into pieces. The person's distorted, pained, sad or angry face appears in the fragments, but that's their true face. The mirror is a reflection of ourselves. I felt a bit empty when the eight-story office building's elevator no longer had the mirror. Maybe someone who didn't want to face their true self had deliberately broken it. Maybe someone shattered it because it recorded all their falseness. Perhaps it accidentally broke, or the building management decided to replace it with a new one. But no matter how new it is, it's just a mirror, and nobody looks better or worse because of it, because in the mirror, they are still just themselves. I didn't feel relieved. I just felt a bit sad about missing something that clearly reflected me every time I entered my workplace. I didn't avoid the elevator just because I looked bad in the mirror. I just missed something I used to do every time I stepped into the elevator. People might replace the old mirror for some reason with a new one. They might refurbish the elevator to make it wider, more modern, or nicer smelling, but I would still ride it. I still want to see the most authentic reflection of myself there, no matter what. Distorted, sad, bored, or cheerful, I am always just me. If one day I take the stairs just because I fear seeing my face in that true mirror, then no one would read what I write like this. The blog would die and I wouldn't be here anymore. Not because of the mirror, but because I lost myself. 85. What we need most. 1. It was a very peaceful evening, and my family was watching our favorite TV show when the phone rang. My mom picked it up, listened intently, and simply responded with, I see, I see, uh-huh, before hanging up. Then she did something unusual, she unplugged the phone jack and returned to watching the movie with us. That night, the Dongshuan market was on fire. A panicked friend had called to tell her that the fire had reached our fabric stall. What followed were years of hardship and rebuilding from scratch. Once I asked my mom about that night and she calmly said, I didn't want your dad to panic and rush over there in case something happened. Despite our family's livelihood being at stake, in that moment, she only thought of my father. 2. My sister had been saving up to buy a piece of land on the outskirts of town. She was in a rush to meet the seller and put down a deposit, so she hailed a taxi. On the way, she saw a group of people, including a little girl who had been gored by a buffalo, desperately asking for a ride to Hanoi for emergency medical help. My sister immediately told the driver to turn around and took the girl, her mother, and everyone straight to Hanoi. The girl's mother was paralyzed with fear, just holding her daughter and crying. 
My sister managed everything at the hospital, even paying the hospital fees when she found out the mother didn't have enough money. After making sure the girl was safe, my sister returned home, never complaining about the cost of the ride, the hospital fees, or missing out on the land. And every new year, we have visitors from their village. 3. My dad is a successful man who loves his job and often works from early morning until late at night, sacrificing sleep and meals. And my mom, to most people, seems like a very ordinary woman with simple worries. But once, my dad told me that even though he loves his work, he doesn't really need it, nor does he need much money or property. All he needs is my mom. With her, he has everything, including us, his most precious treasures. Sometimes, you might be surprised by the people you cherish, the tranquility in their souls, their simple yet firm decisions, their calmness in the face of things that might seem important but aren't really, the way they deeply care about people, simple yet intense. Understanding them, you'll grasp the joy of sailors seeing land, travelers spotting their village, astronauts glimpsing Earth through their spaceship window, or like Robinson Crusoe finding Friday. The tender smile anyone has when seeing a newborn baby, it explains why humans endlessly search for civilizations beyond Earth, and the unbearable pain that turns into tears and screams when people lose each other due to natural disasters, wars, or illness. Have you realized that what humans need most in this world is not fame, money, property, or land? Have you noticed that what we truly need most is each other? 86. Can I hug you just once? We were classmates in college. I've loved you for as long as I can remember, but you never felt the same because I wasn't the Prince Charming from your dreams. After graduation, you took a job in a southern city and I left everything behind to follow you. But your feelings didn't change and you seemed unhappy whenever I showed up. You had a boyfriend and once when I came to see you, you told me, don't come here anymore, I have a boyfriend. I saw disappointment in your eyes and you wanted me to stop hoping. After a moment of silence, I asked, do you love him? You didn't answer but happiness was evident in your eyes. As I turned to leave, I asked, Can I hug you just once? You shook your head firmly. After that, I never tried to see you again, and gradually you forgot about me. Then one day, I showed up and said, Can we grab a coffee? I'm leaving for America tomorrow. You agreed, thinking I'd be far away soon. We were slowly sipping our coffee when your boyfriend called. You smiled, apologized, and said, I have to go. I smiled back and said, let me walk you out. As you opened the door, I stopped you and asked decisively, can I hug you just once? You wanted to refuse, but after a moment you nodded. I stepped forward and gently hugged you. You tensed as you felt my breath. I softly ran my fingers down your back, from your neck down your spine, gently touching but not pressing hard. Anger flared within you and you thought, if he goes any further, I'll kick him. But I stopped there, gently let you go and said, I'm relieved now. You stood stunned for a moment, then realized what I meant. Your throat tightened and a haze clouded your vision. In our third year of college during a trip, you had a car accident that broke your spine, causing you ongoing pain. You thought, I didn't know about it. The next day, I flew to America. You stood on the rooftop watching the airplane fly away, everything seeming a blur. Hey, everyone. Your comments truly matter, offering insights and motivation to others and uplifting our creative team at Lighthouse of Wisdom Channel. Sharing your thoughts and experiences enriches our community. So... Let's get the conversation started below and help illuminate our path with your wisdom.